welcome to day one of our two-day virtual public meeting, where we've gathered a number of speakers to discuss best practices in buprenorphine initiation and maintenance care, strategies for increasing patient access, and priorities for research and product development. I'm Susan Winkler, and I have the honor of serving as the Chief Executive Officer for the Reagan Udall Foundation for the FDA. We're so pleased to be working with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to host this virtual event both today and tomorrow, and I hope you'll join us for both days. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping issues we need to run through. Because of the size of the meeting, attendee cameras and microphones will remain off throughout the event. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers and panels. I hope that you will agree with that. And we have used the questions that you submitted during registration to inform the discussion that we'll have with those panelists. We also have a few moments in each session to address audience questions. We invite you to submit your questions and your comments through the question and answer function. I'll note we are recording the meeting and we will post the recording along with the slide deck and the transcript on the FDA Foundation website next week. To orient you to our time together, I want, quickly want to have you run through our agenda. In just a moment, I'll be turning the podium over to Dr. Marta Sokolowska from the FDA and Dr. Ingvold Olson from SAMHSA to offer opening remarks. Then we will move through a series of sessions we will, where we will hear about clinical best practices for buprenorphine care, additional forms for support beyond the medication, and what else is needed in terms of formulations of buprenorphine to meet patients' needs. The full agenda is available on the FDA Foundation website, and the link is posted in the chat. Now, to help set the stage, I want to invest just a moment to ground our conversation. So over the next two days, we're discussing buprenorphine, which is available for different indications, so how it's used, in different combinations, what other drugs it can be packaged with, and in different formulations, so how it actually gets into a patient's body. I want to quickly walk through these and note that the chart here is on the Foundation website on the event page. So buprenorphine formulations have been approved by the FDA for two quite different indications, to treat opioid use disorder or separately to treat pain. Buprenorphine is available as both a monoproduct, so straight buprenorphine, and a combination product with naloxone. On the screen now, this is um, showing you a list of currently available formulations of the just buprenorphine product. You'll see there it can be taken as a tablet or a film that dissolves in the mouth or be given as a long-acting injection, an injection can be a patch worn on the skin um, or a short acting injection. So we have a number of different ways that it can get into the patient's body. Buprenorphine is also available as a combination product with naloxone. So we have a next um, display of that. Many people know the buprenorphine uh, naloxone by one of the branded names, um, the Boxone. The combination product was designed to reduce the chances of muse, misuse or diversion. So it's often the preferred formulation if using the tablet or the film. Now, I'll note that in our conversations, speakers will refer to buprenorphine rather generally and for its use in treating opioid use disorder. I apologize up front for that lack of precision, but our discussions are exploring the various dimensions of using the active pharmaceutical ingredient buprenorphine in one of its currently available formulations to treat opioid use disorder. And if you wanna refer back to this table during the meeting, it is on the FDA Foundation website. And there is a link in the chat now or will be shortly. Now, one more minute. I wanna do just a quick snapshot of a potential patient journey to access buprenorphine and to illustrate what we're gonna discuss over the next two days. So the next slide has a number of steps that patients navigate to begin and maintain using buprenorphine. So patients might become aware of or have the opportunity to begin buprenorphine treatment in a number of different ways. After experiencing an overdose, through an outpatient clinic, an inpatient stay, through harm reduction programs, or other peer recovery services. So there's an assessment by a prescriber. 
And then the patient and that prescriber work together to decide whether to start buprenorphine and work out a strategy for starting it. Throughout today's sessions, we're going to hear more about specific initiation strategies and the many factors that are considered when choosing how to start buprenorphine. After you make the decision to start, then there's a prescription for ongoing care and accessing the medication through a pharmacy. What you see on this slide and what we're going to talk about over the next two days is there are many dynamics and some barriers that can emerge as we're going through that journey. So we wanted to give you a quick snapshot of what we're going to talk about over the next two days. And with that, let's dive into today's program. And I'm going to move to the virtual room that has our keynote speakers, introduce them, and we will be on our way. Substance Use and Behavioral Health in FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, and Dr. Ingvald Olson, who serves as the Director of the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA. Dr. Sokolowska, you are first up, so please take it away. Thank you very much, Susan, and good afternoon. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I welcome, welcome you all to this public workshop on buprenorphine initiation and maintenance care for opioid disorder. I would like to express my gratitude to all speakers, our panelists and attendees for joining us today and directing us to a deeper understanding and impactful opportunities in expanding access to medication for the treatment of OUD. We are here to learn from clinicians, pharmacists, people who want this treatment and the community supporting them such as peer recovery specialists. Impactful changes cannot happen without you. So thank you for taking the time and joining us today. I would like to take the opportunity to recognize Regan Ural Foundation for organizing this workshop and working with SAMHSA and FDA staff to de develop a robust agenda that gives a voice to both challenges and opportunities in improving buprenorphine treatment and quality of care. We could not do this work without them or without you all. The overdose crisis remains one of the country's most pressing public health concerns and a top priority for the FDA. In 2021, more people aged 15 to 54 died in the United States due to opiate-involved overdose than due to COVID. Medication for opiate use disorders are safe, effective, and regret regrettably underused treatment options. According to National Survey of Drug Use of Health uh, in 2021 data report, only about 22% of 2.5 million people with past year opioid use disorder received medication for the disease. The question is how do we provide more treatment to those who need it? This workshop is a small but an important effort we are undertaking to implement comprehensive approach. We've named the FDA overdose prevention framework. This framework was established last August to undertake impactful creative actions to prevent drug overdoses and reduce deaths. This workshop is part of a collection of actions under one of the FDA framework's priorities, which focuses on advancing evidence-based treatments for substance use disorder. More specifically, uh, we are here today to focus on expanding access to medication for OUD, which is a lasting area of focus for FDA. I want to highlight a few actions uh, we have taken to support buprenorphine treatment. To encourage innovation and development of new treatments uh, for opioid use disorder, in the past few years, FDA published several guidances for industry, including on clinical endpoints for de demonstrating effectiveness for OUD, uh, and drug development for, uh, for modified release products uh, for injection and implantation. Additionally, FDA has approved new dosages of both branded and generic buprenorphine products in the past few years. 
I would like to briefly highlight the importance of two pieces of recent legislation that are quite impactful for treatment of uh, people with opioid use disorder. The first one is the, the Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act or the MATH Act, which removed the federal requirement for practitioners to have an X waiver to prescribe buprenorphine for treatment of opioid use disorder. This will permit all healthcare providers with current DA registration the ability to prescribe buprenorphine for OUD, just like they prescribe other controlled substances medications. Second, the Medication Access and Training Expansion Act, or the MATE Act, requires healthcare providers to complete an eight hour one time training of, of managing patients with substance use disorder. Um, this is a condition of receiving or renewing DEA registration to prescribe controlled substances. FDA remains committed to work with our federal partners to ensure that prescriber education is comprehensive and appropriate regarding conditions such as pain and substance use disorder. We expect to hear a little bit more about that from our SAMHSA colleagues today. On note of working with federal partners, uh, I have one more buprenorphine related activity to tell you about that took place just this morning. In collaboration with SAMHSA, we issued a joint letter to healthcare providers. This letter elevates person center prescribing and clarifies that counseling, while recommended and beneficial, is not a prerequisite for initiating on continuing buprenorphine treatment for opioid use disorder. And today, Thanks to our collaboration with SAMHSA and the Regan Ural Foundation, we have brought together a wide range of experts who will be sharing their knowledge and insights, which we'll carefully consider in developing actionable outcomes under FDA authorities. But let's talk why we are here today, about improving access uh, and uptake of buprenorphine treatment for opioid use disorder remains a key challenge and opportunity as the drug overdose crisis evolves. Buprenorphine is a safe and effective medication for OUD. However, we have heard that there are barriers to buprenorphine initiation and long-term care we hope uh, to bring to the forefront today. I see these barriers as opportunities we can all work together to address. I also see them as call to action for regulators, researchers, and sponsors to work together and meet the needs of the people on the ground, the treatment providers and those wanting the treatment. We are going to hear about barriers to buprenorphine initiation. We recognize that the need to be in mild to moderate withdrawal is a challenge to initiation and the difficulties posed by this level of withdrawal are increased due to fentanyl and other synthetic opiates in the illicit drug supply today. In the context of this unmet need, Various buprenorphine initiation strategies, including low and high dose initiations, are being used in clinical practice. Some are working better than others in different settings and in different populations. We are hoping to hear from researchers as well as those in the trenches about best practices, lessons learned, and where support is needed. Beyond the initiation, there are challenges to continuation of care. We hope to learn about the successes and pain points in optimizing buprenorphine dosing and management in the transition to stabilization and maintenance. Initiation is happening at various settings, emergency medical services in uh, emergency departments in outpatient facilities through telehealth. How do we optimize outcomes after initiation? How do different patients, um, what do different patients need to succeed? And how do we define success? We also can't ignore that for some patients, there may be a need, or in some cases want, to discontinue buprenorphine. This may be due to a health condition, an access issue, or desire by a patient. In cases where it's indicated, how and when should patients safely taper? In covering these topics, I expect to hear about product needs from those who use, dispense, and prescribe buprenorphine for OUD. We are available for discussions with sponsors when appropriate about the data needed to change or update product labels, the potential for expedited review of uh, product applications where appropriate, and other ways 
we can support areas of unmet need. I also want to hear about specific research needs to support product developments, improved patient care, and ch changes to policy. Several of our federal partners are here today, and for your input, with your input will help inform our understanding of gaps in research and data and plans to address those gaps. In conclusion, impact of, of overdose crisis and opioid use disorder touches us all. Once again, I'm grateful that people who use drugs, families, friends, harm reduction organizations, first responders, pharmacists, clinicians, researchers, and federal partners are taking the time for joining us today for this important conversation. This diverse set of voices and experiences is key to advance our collective understanding of what is and isn't working in buprenorphine treatment for opioid use disorder. We need to come to a better understanding of how buprenorphine is being used to start and keep patients in treatment when they are ready to seek it. We often hear that the perfect medicine isn't perfect if no one wants to use it. So I cannot overemphasize the need to listen to those on the ground. Their real world experiences must inform and in many cases drive innovation. And we must be agile in meeting their needs if we want to make a difference. I hope this workshop can serve as a catalyst for improved treatment approaches, research collaboration, product development, and policy change. Thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to a productive and informative discussion. With that, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Olsen from SAMHSA. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Marta, um, Dr. Sokolowska. Thank you so much to the Reagan Udall Foundation. Um, uh, for convening um, this uh, important, important workshop. And thank you all for being here. Um, you know, SAMHSA is incredibly um, uh, excited to be part of this. And, uh, you know, with our partners at the FDA, um, our partners that you're going to hear from also from DEA um, tomorrow, our uh, partners with NIDA, this really is about a partnership because as, uh, you know, Dr. Sokolowska mentioned, oh that um, when there are over 107,000 people who died of an overdose, uh, primarily driven by illicitly manufactured fentanyl um, in 2021 alone, and we have effective tools like buprenorphine, we really need to do um, absolutely what we can to make sure that people actually can have uh, and benefit from the access and, and benefit from those medications. You know. Um, much of what SAMHSA does is really to try and promote um, access to an uptake of buprenorphine in various different settings. Overdose prevention is one of the um, key strategic priorities for SAMHSA, and it is one of the pillars. Um, uh, the evident access to evidence-based treatments is one of the pillars for uh, the HHS overdose prevention strategy as well. And you know, the actions that have the policy changes that uh, that Dr. Sokolowska mentioned in terms of the mainstream addiction treatment act that removed the requirement for a special waiver to prescribe buprenorphine is an incredibly huge step in the right direction to um, to really be able to advance um, access to buprenorphine. Um, the medication, uh, um, uh, the MAID Act, Medication Access and Tra uh, Training Expansion Act, likewise is a um, significant partnership between various different federal agencies to really make sure that um, practitioners have the training in substance use disorders, including opioid use disorder, to really be able to take advantage of these other policy changes that, uh, that Dr. Sokolowska mentioned. And finally, you know, the fact that um, we now have uh, medications uh, like buprenorphine um, and expansions and, and different proposals related to methadone access as well, um, I think is puts us in a kind of historic uh, place in time to really have uh, advances in um, in how we are addressing and treating opioid use disorder. You know, as an addiction medicine specialist, I have watched over the past 20 years how the um, uh, the situation on the ground with respect to opioids and opioid use disorder have evolved from prescription opioids to heroin and now to illicitly manufactured fentanyl. And that situation really has uh, created uh, a need for looking at how we are prescribing buprenorphine, how we are initiating buprenorphine, how we are helping people stay on buprenorphine, as well as how we're really uh, learning from 
the flexibilities that we have all, uh, um, as practitioners, been living under um, uh, for the past several years under COVID. And so I think today's and tomorrow's workshop um, and hearing from the number of different experts, uh, the multidisciplinary voices and the multiple voices across research providers, peers, uh, people with lived experience, uh, you know, in various different settings is going to provide additional information and really a significant amount of um, learning for us as we really continue to look at how to advance these, um, these therapies. So I just want to say thank you all for what you do every day. Um, and thank you for being here and being part of this incredibly important work. Um, and so appreciate uh, the opportunity for SAMHSA to be partners um, with FDA and with the Reagan Udall Foundation um, in, uh, in really learning from all of you. And with that, I'll have to pass it back to um, Susan. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sokolowska and Olson. I, I heard you clearly talk about cross-agency collaboration, the multidisciplinary approach, and the efforts that uh, we want to pursue to do a better job in treating op patients with opioid use disorder and preventing um, those overdose deaths. So thank you for kicking off our meeting and for helping make this meeting happen so that we can advance care um, for these uh, important individuals. With that, we're going to turn to our first session where we're going to hear an overview of the current clinical guidelines. So I want to introduce Dr. Melissa Weimer, who is Associate Professor of Medicine and Public Health at the Yale School of Medicine and Medical Director of the Yale Addiction Medicine Consult Service. Dr. Weimer is also the Chair of the American Society of Addiction Medicine Clinical Practice Guideline Methodology and Oversight Committee. Uh, we are going to turn to the virtual room with Dr. Weimer and um, dig into our first content presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me. Very happy to be here with you all today. Um, I'm Dr. Melissa Weimer. I'm here uh, to discuss buprenorphine clinical considerations and clinical practice guidelines that have been established by the American Society of Addiction Medicine. So I wanted to spend a minute to talk about the American Society of Addiction Medicine and the clinical practice guidelines that we produce. Um, the scope of our clinical practice guidelines typically involve um, areas within the scope of addiction medicine that address prevention of addiction, screening for addiction, diagnosis of addiction, and then treatment. Sorry. Sorry, I need to go back and it's not letting me. Nope, going forward, not back. <laughs> All right, keep going. All right. Thank you. Um, so the um, ASAM uh, in starting in 2021, um, started to update our clinical practice guideline methodology. So we have had produced clinical practice guidelines for a very long time. Uh, however, in 2021, uh, a group, a committee was established that I chair that is working to establish a new methodology. And the reason for the update is so that we can be within the standards of the um, IOM for clinical practice guidelines that we trust and to uh, do many of the things that are listed here on this slide, essentially to establish transparency, better manage conflicts of interest if they um, occur, balance um, our guideline group composition. So we are you know, clearly uh, representing many different um, perspectives and um, expertise around the country. Uh, utilizing a systematic review and all of our clinical practice guidelines, 
with all of our recommendations, establishing a strength of evidence that supports them and then a strength of the recommendation. We want to be able to articulate our recommendations clearly and succinctly, engaging stakeholder review in all of our clinical practice guidelines, promoting health equity throughout the clinical practice guidelines, and then establishing a clear process for any of our updates to our clinical practice guidelines. So I state that just to level set so you have an idea of the hard work that ASAM is doing to ensure that our clinical practice guideline methodology is the best that it can be and the most transparent and the most um, able to address many of the complexities that we're seeing at the same time, making sure that we are establishing what the evidence is for some of the clinical practice guidelines. And unfortunately, within the management of addiction, sometimes our, our evidence is not as robust as we would like it to be. I think I'm going to have to have someone else uh, take my slides for me. I'm sorry. I'm not. Thank you. So I'll just let you know when I need to go forward. Um, so in the updates of the methodology that we have established, we also recognize that there are times when, as I just stated, evidence does not necessar necessarily support a full clinical practice guideline. However, we continue to want to be responsive to the needs of our patients and of our profession and make sure that we are able to provide uh, consensus statements, guidance when it is needed. So you can see here that within the last two years, we have established some different types of clinical documents, and I'm going to present one, two of them to you today, but one of them specifically, a new type of document uh, called a clinical consideration. So I discussed what a clinical practice guideline is. It's based on very rigorous scientific evidence, very time intensive. There are other types of um, statements that we can provide, such as a clinical consensus statement, which is still informed by evidence, but may have a broader scope, maybe based more on case studies or reviews um, and a scoping type of literature review. And then finally, for areas such as, say, the initiation of buprenorphine in the setting of high potency synthetic opioids, we needed to create something such as a clinical consideration. And this is a document that is a clinical document uh, meant to address issues that are immediately clinically relevant, though we may have limited evidence. And these clinical considerations are typically informed by narrative literature review and really based on expert clinical consensus. And so I will present that to you today. Uh, next slide. Before presenting that, I do want to bring your attention to an existing ASAM clinical practice guideline for opioid use disorder. The original clinical practice guideline was written in 2015. It was then updated in a focused update in 2020. The focused update had 35 revised recommendations, 13 of which were new, and then there were 14 that were specific to buprenorphine, which I'll cl uh, quickly over um, go over. And this is freely available. You can find this on the ASAM website. Next slide. So the 2020 opioid use disorder focused update that was specific, part of it specific to buprenorphine, I've listed some of the uh, key recommendations that related to buprenorphine initiation and treatment. So within this 2020 opioid use disorder focused update, there was um, the recommendation that you should initiate buprenorphine once opioid withdrawal begins. The starting dose for buprenorphine was a dose of two to four milligrams with a recommendation to increase by two to eight milligrams at a time. Uh, the, recommend, the clinical practice guideline discussed that office-based and home initiation are both safe and effective. There was um, information about following initiation of dose. And so the recommendation there was to titrate the dose of buprenorphine to alleviate symptoms. In the clinical practice guidelines, 16 milligrams or more was generally recommended, and they stated that there was limited evidence on doses greater than 24 milligrams per day. The clinical practice guideline recommended not to delay or withhold treatment if patients did not want to engage in psychosocial treatments, and they recommended monitoring and support of patients with medication management. 
There was no time limit placed on how long someone should be treated with buprenorphine. And the authors recognized that buprenorphine taper, you know, could be a very challenging time and should be a slow process that needs careful monitoring. Next slide. This was written in the clinical practice guideline focus update was written in 2019, published in 2020. And yes, we had high synthetic, um, high potency synthetic opioids within our drug supply at that time. But really, you know, after 2020 is when the complexity of buprenorphine initiation and some of the issues that are going to be discussed today really became a bit more apparent. So some of the clinical complexity that we have you know, recognized and know that we need to be responsive to um, are the presence of high potency synthetic opioids in our drug supply. There's also since uh, 2019 has been the uh, use of low dose initiation, which I know is going to be a topic of discussion today. There's been the um, use of high dose initiation. We've had more reported um, uh, incidents of precipitated opioid withdrawal. However, you know, I, I know there's some uh, recent um, research that's that's really sort of countered the extent to um, that we're seeing that. We've also seen xylazine and other novel components um, within the drug supply. And then of course, extended release buprenorphine became more available. So these are some of the things that have really changed since 2020 that we, we need and want to be responsive to. So that led to the development of the um, recommend, some of the recommendations I'm gonna provide for you today. Sorry, go back, 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 back. Okay, now go forward. <laughs> All right, so again, we um, have created, and this will be coming out hopefully in the next couple months, a clinical consideration document specifically for um, some of these complexities, again, meant to be you know, highly clinically um, relevant to address some of these real world complexities. It is based on expert consensus, uh, mostly, even though we have, to the extent possible, included all the evidence we have for this topic. Um, you know, there is limited evidence for this at this time. And of course, it's less rigorous than a clinical practice guideline or consensus statement. Next slide. So these are the authors of the buprenorphine clinical considerations writing committee. Um, there were uh, five authors listed here, and then they had an extensive peer review, as well as by the ASAM um, Quality Improvement Council and the ASAM Board of Directors, and it has been um, has been approved by um, all of those entities. Next slide. This are the key questions and the key components. So we're really discussing individuals with severe opioid use disorder who are chronically exposed to high potency synthetic opioids. We include pregnant individuals and we're discussing initiation, stabilization, long-term treatment, comparing to our current existing clinical practice guideline and really addressing this in any setting. Next slide. So I don't have time to go through all of the, the considerations that we've listed. So I'm going to only discuss two of the key questions that we asked, and I'm going to quickly go through some of the clinical considerations that we have uh, created. Next slide. So one of our key questions was, what specific clinical situations favor use of low or high dose buprenorphine initiation strategies? And you can see the clinical considerations here basically showing that observational data suggests that buprenorphine initiation is best individualized by setting and patient preference. Low-dose buprenorphine with opioid continuation, which we have defined within the clinical consideration document, in hospital settings appears to be well-tolerated based on observational data. We need more evidence to determine the optimal strategy for low-dose initiation in ambulatory settings for patients who are ineligible for medically prescribed full agonist opioids under our current regulations within the United States, and in patients with chronic exposure to high-potency synthetic opioids who are initiating buprenorphine after abstinence and development of withdrawal, rapid dose escalation has been observed to be safe primarily in the emergency department setting. Next slide. So we've summarized that here. 
This is going to be a quick uh, summary, as you can see. Um, and again, this should be coming out in the next uh, month, hopefully in the Journal of Addiction Medicine. Next slide. Key question three, after buprenorphine initiation, what range of buprenorphine dosing and or dosing strategies can be considered during stabilization and long-term treatment? And so we have acknowledged that some patients with high opioid tolerance may require buprenorphine doses greater than 24 milligrams per day, particularly during the stabilization phase of treatment. We um, discussed that there are physiologic changes during pregnancy that alter metabolism, necessitating an adjustment of dose and dosing intervals. Um, we recommend that you consider dose and frequency adjustments, psychosocial supports, and a higher level of care if individuals are, um, are unable to stabilize on buprenorphine. And then consider a reassessment of the higher dose, greater than 24 milligrams of long-term doses, uh, once patients really enter that long-term stab um, form of treatment if they do not have any ongoing use of opioids. Next slide. Um, what are some of the indications for injectable extended release buprenorphine compared to the sublingual formulations? Well, we discussed that ex um, considering extended release buprenorphine formulations for individuals who are unable to stabilize on the sublingual formulation, particularly for individuals who've had extensive high potency synthetic opioid exposure, they have unsafe living environments or multiple overdoses. Considering the administration um, of extended release buprenorphine soon after successful buprenorphine initiation to achieve a durable um, overdose prevention. And then while extended release buprenorphine is reaching that steady state, we need to consider the risks and benefits of additional sublingual buprenorphine particularly for pregnant individuals. Next slide. So I'm happy to take any questions. I know that was a very quick overview, um, but I hope that we were able to quickly present some of the salient features from our new clinical consideration for buprenorphine. Dr. Weimer, that was great. It's so appreciate you walking us through a bit on the, the process and how you got there, as well as then the, the results and what, in fact, those clinical guidelines are. So we appreciate that. You've set us a good grounding so that we're ready to go to our next session where we will talk about buprenorphine initiation in the inpatient setting. So with that, I'm going to leave this virtual meeting room and go to the next virtual meeting room. But thank you so much, Dr. Weimer. I have found my way into the virtual meeting room that has our next panel. So our next session, we want to talk about buprenorphine initiation in the inpatient setting. So here, we're exploring starting buprenorphine in that inpatient hospital setting, care that takes place in the hospital and the pre-hospital setting. We'll talk about care in outpatient or the community setting in the following session. So for this discussion, we are going to begin with a presentation from Dr. Ama Rahimala, who is Clinical Associate Professor at Stanford University in the Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Department. He specializes in the treatment of addiction and is the Director of the Addiction Medicine Consult Service at Stanford Hospital. Dr. Rahimala, the microphone is yours. We are anxious to hear your presentation. Okay, great. Thanks so much for ha having me. Before we talk about inductions in the inpatient setting, I wanted to talk about the goals of induction, regardless of the setting. The induction is not the goal in itself, but it's a means to stable buprenorphine maintenance. And through buprenorphine maintenance, not using it once or twice, through buprenorphine maintenance, we get all the great outcomes like decreased mortality, improved outcomes, improved patient retention, decreased illicit drug use. 
The second goal of induction is to minimize withdrawal, to increase our chances to get to buprenorphine maintenance. So on one end, we don't want to give buprenorphine too soon and precipitate withdrawal. But on the other end, we don't want to wait so long that we unnecessarily prolong withdrawal. Withdrawal increases dropout. And if we can avoid withdrawal altogether, that's great. The third goal is keeping people on buprenorphine and illicit opioids is not the goal in people with opioid use disorder. The ideal goal is buprenorphine maintenance without illicit opioid use. The goal is to increase the buprenorphine as quickly as possible to achieve an adequate dose that treats withdrawal and cravings and to stop illicit opioids as soon as possible if they're continued. So understanding these goals of induction, then we have a menu of buprenorphine inductions available in order to achieve those goals. There's a great paper reference at the bottom that discusses macrodose inductions, microdose inductions, standard inductions. It summarizes the evidence, clinical scenarios that highlight which method to use, especially in the era of fentanyl. Feel free to read it. I'm going to attempt to give us a helicopter view of these. The first induction style, standard induction. So guidelines suggest clinicians typically wait for opioid withdrawal to manifest, then administer an initial buprenorphine dose of two to four milligrams, wait one to two hours. If well tolerated, administer additional doses in a stepwise fashion up to 60 milligrams on day one. Some guidelines recommend up to eight milligrams on day one. High dose inductions differ in that they typically start with eight milligrams or more. Um, for example, the American College of Emergency Physicians suggests starting at eight milligrams. There's also rapid high dose or macro dose inductions that start at 16 milligrams or more, as seen in the reference at the bottom. And can, you can administer up to 32 milligrams of sublingual buprenorphine within the first few hours. Low dose inductions are different in that they don't wait for withdrawal to develop. And in fact, if withdrawal develops, it sort of um, beats, uh, the per defeats the purpose of it. So with low dose inductions, we start with small doses of buprenorphine, small enough that they don't precipitate withdrawal, and these overlap their current opioid use. So, you know, we're going to go into low indu uh, dose inductions in more depth, but the point I want to make here is that you want to pick the best option for the setting and the patient. So when we, would talk, when we talk about inductions in the inpatient setting on the next slide, um, the ED will be the most, the emergency department will be the most uh, uh, often, will most often be the first point of contact prior to patients being admitted to the hospital. The ED will have its own set of considerations. Higher dose inductions are used here for many reasons, including the increased potency of illicit opioids, commonly encountered delays in access to follow-up care and other reasons as well. It's important to recognize the ED is a low barrier setting to get people on buprenorphine easy and fast. If I want to go to the clinic to get buprenorphine, you have to schedule appointments, wait for them, so on and so forth. But the ED is a low barrier setting to get buprenorphine easy and fast. It also needs to be simple and fast for ED providers to get trained on and implement buprenorphine inductions. Complicated, slow protocols for ED physicians are not high yield and may not be practical for wide adoption. Most ED clinicians should continue buprenorphine inductions using established guidelines, such as the disseminate, those disseminated by the American College of Emergency Physicians, which recommend eight milligrams, starting with eight milligrams. This is likely gonna be discussed more by our panelists, but the point I'd like to make here is that low dose inductions generally become a consideration when we're talking about the inpatient setting generally become a consideration after patients are admitted. On the next slide, if buprenorphine is started in the emergency department, great. After they're admitted, you maintain that buprenorphine. If not started yet and their admission does not require opioids, then you have another opportunity to just start the buprenorphine directly while they're admitted if withdrawal is anticipated. However, if withdrawal is not anticipated, if their hospital admission requires opioids, like full agonist opioids, such as morphine and oxycodone, which many hospital admissions do, then a standard induction or directly starting buprenorphine is not an option because oftentimes 
patients will stay on opioids, full agonist opioids throughout their hospitalization and perhaps afterwards. And we don't want to miss that opportunity to start buprenorphine in them. On the next slide, when people are admitted to the hospital, it's, it's because they're ill enough to be admitted to the hospital. So regardless if people need opioids or not in the hospital, patients requiring hospitalization are often fragile and cannot risk opioid withdrawal, worsening their conditions. Opioid withdrawal is an unnecessary layer of complexity that affects multiple organ systems, and it can be avoided with low-dose inductions. And one of the largest studies examining low-dose initiation and the hospital setting referenced at the bottom, researchers documented the reasons for using low-dose buprenorphine. Most common reasons were acute pain, followed by patients already having a high level of distress while, in the while they're in the hospital, or medical fragility. Other reasons were previous failures with the traditional induction. Examples of patients that can't tolerate opioid withdrawal include patients with opioid use disorder who are post-op and require opioids for acute pain needs or patients with, uh, who have sustained a trauma, possibly due to being intoxicated, which fits the archetype of somebody with uh, opioid use disorder. Also, patients with opioid use disorder and co occurring acute psychiatric conditions. With patients with co-occurring uh, acute psychiatric conditions, we have to treat their opioid use disorder to treat their psychiatric conditions. And they can't often tolerate the dysphoria and anxiety of going into opioid withdrawal before starting buprenorphine. Then there's people that just don't wanna tolerate opioid with withdrawal uh, on the next bullet point. So there's people that are ambivalent, uh, ambivalent about opioid use disorder medications, patients that are on methadone who want to switch to buprenorphine because of some new development in their hospitalization, which doesn't allow them to be on methadone, or patients in the outpatient setting, stable on methadone, want to st switch to buprenorphine, and don't want to go into the days of withdrawal that it requires to start buprenorphine, and also patients with a history of precipitated withdrawal. On the next slide, the point I want to make here briefly is that patients with opioid use disorder are increasingly being hospitalized. We can't afford to miss opportunities to start buprenorphine due to the hospital factors that I mentioned before. Many of these hospital factors are a downstream consequence of their opioid use disorder. As you see in the slide, opioid use disorder in hospitalized patients are, has quadrupled from 93 to 2016. The opioid epidemic has only gotten exponentially worse since that time. Also, opioid use disorder in hospitalized, hospitalized patients has been increasing 8% annually. So point being, low-dose buprenorphine inductions are an option for many patients in the hospital who would other not, otherwise not be able to start medications for opioid use disorder. On the next slide, sometimes with low-dose buprenorphine inductions, there can be confusion about the names of them. The Bernese method was first described, uh, first described the low dose initiation method, and the authors used the term microdose inductions or microdoses. The term microdoses is still used in the literature, but slowly falling out of favor because microdoses has come to be associated with psychedelics. The term low dose inductions are being used more frequently. It sounds simpler, which reflects the simplicity of the principle behind the method. And the principle is that low doses of buprenorphine don't precipitate withdrawal. So the study reference at the bottom looked at opioid dependent subjects who were receiving 30 to 40 milligrams of methadone. They were opioid dependent. And they measured the vital signs and withdrawal scales in these patients and compared this with giving them placebo on another day. The point is they found that low doses of buprenorphine did not cause withdrawal and there was no significant differences from placebo. So what this means is precipitated withdrawal is not, a is not caused by buprenorphine. It's caused by the starting dose of buprenorphine. Withdrawal is not an inevitable consequence of buprenorphine's partial agonism and high binding affinity. It is due to the starting dose of buprenorphine. On the next slide, just to talk a little bit about how low-dose buprenorphine initiation works, small doses... Uh, you start with small doses, which are considered 0.5 milligrams of sublingual buprenorphine or their buccal film equivalent, which is about 225 micrograms, 
or you use 20 micrograms uh, per hour transdermal patches or less, those are considered small doses. The second main point, and perhaps the most important point, is to continue opioids to prevent withdrawal. Opioids need to be at an adequate dose to prevent withdrawal. So the transdermal protocol that we've been using for the last six years, we rarely see opioid withdrawal. And it only occurs when their full agonist opioid use is clearly too low to meet their opioid debt, their opioid need. So, and oftentimes if you're unable to find an indication for opioids, then you can use methadone for opioid use disorder while you titrate up buprenorphine. And there's many protocols that have been used to switch from methadone to buprenorphine. Your third point is you wanna titrate up the buprenorphine. Ideally, you are on an adequate dose of buprenorphine in a matter of days because hospitalizations can be unpredictable. There are several protocols that can, that can get you on an eight milligram dose of buprenorphine within 48 hours and 16 milligrams within 72 hours. If you know your patients will be there longer, then you can consider a longer up titration, but you want to avoid keeping your patients hospitalized unnecessarily if a faster protocol can be used safely. So um, the recent review at the bottom discusses different starting doses and durations uh, that have been reported in the literature. So I'm going to attempt to simplify that. With trans, uh, transmucosal formulations, sublingual doses are commonly 0.5 milligram doses or below. The problem with that is the lowest commercially available sublingual dose is two milligrams. So patients have to cut their dose or inpatient pharmacies have to cut their dose. So a half a milligram is a quarter film or tablet. And then the up and, and 0.25 milligrams, which is also used in the studies is one eighth of a tablet. Um, and the duration to reach 12 milligrams and some of the reports have been by day three. But typically, these protocols, the sublingual pro protocols, are four to seven days. Um, and um, the buckle formulation, the largest study using buckle film started at 225 micrograms. The transdermal protocols start at 20 microgram patches or below. And eight milligram doses can be reached by 48 to 72 hours. I'm going to start to talk about the barriers to transdermal inductions. And if we don't get to this, or finish this uh, in my time, what we can do is discuss the rest of it in our panel discussion. In general, transdermal protocols published tend to be faster, reaching an eight milligram dose by day two and 60 milligram dose by day three or four. Low dose inductions use patches. Using patches were first described in 2015. Patients were, patients were on eight milligrams by day two or three. This protocol was used at other institutions and shown to be safe. Um, and demonstrated the same timeline uh, over the years. And another study that just came out a few months back, a reference at the bottom, uh, shows that this faster transdermal option is still well tolerated with no incidence of precipitated withdrawal. And in, in their study, they had 54% of them as fentanyl users. The problem with the transdermal uh, induction on the next slide, the, the problem is that pa patches are currently only FDA approved for pain and they are expensive as an outpatient. So films are a few dollars, patches are a few hundred dollars, and they're not consistently covered by insurances. Um, and uh, the transdermal route can be better facilitated with FDA approval for opioid use disorder. Inexpensive transdermal formulations or better insurance coverage. Um, and on the next slide, I can talk a little bit about the barriers to sublingual buprenorphine. I, I believe I have a few minutes left. Um, for the sublingual preparation, many of the protocols take longer to get on an eight milligram dose, typically four to seven days, but there are protocols that have been done in fewer days. Um, for opioid use disorder patients, the goal is to reduce their time on illicit opioids or hospital administered opioids uh, that are short acting and highly reinforcing as fast as possible. So shorter protocols are generally preferred, whether that be sublingual, transdermal, buccal, also, the most common low doses are 0.5 milligrams to 0.25 milligrams um, on the next um, point. However, cutting the pills and films lacks precision and can generate uncertainty, confusion. They're difficult to explain. They're complicated to explain. High-performance liquid chromatography analysis only showed a content uniformity in films cut in half. 
Inpatient pharmacies may not approve films cut in a quarter because of this, uh, because of this lack of established content uniformity in films. Uh, but buckle film preparations are still available and still an option. And sublingual and buckle films are a great option, uh, if pa especially if patients are going to be hospitalized for, for days and uh, will be around for that um, protocol. Some solutions to these barriers include manufacturing smaller doses of sublingual buprenorphine. If patients can just start on sublingual buprenorphine and continue on it, that's obviously preferred. Other solutions are pre-formulated medication packaging or blister packs to make dosing simpler and more research to develop clinicians' confidence in sublingual buprenorphine, uh, sublingual buprenorphine's ability to do faster protocols. Thanks so much. We can skip this part. I know I don't have much time left. That's I can't do this justice. So That's I'm okay. To, well, yeah. so we know we want to do do this, and we'll I'll ask our panel to come on camera while you finish that last slide. Okay, great. Sounds good. So the evidence for low dose initiation is limited and based on retrospective studies, case series, and case reports. For opioid use disorder, we want to learn how to use low dose inductions to get people on therapeutic doses of buprenorphine of 8 to 16 milligrams or higher as fast as possible. So this means what is the highest dose we can start with? How fast can we up, up titrate buprenorphine? And how fast can we get them off their other opioids? We also want to know what formulations and protocols lead to the most adherence. There are better quality studies underway. One randomized controlled trial is in progress with an anticipated completion date of, of 2026. Until then, we have enough information to start using low dose inductions for people that would otherwise not start uh, buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. Excellent. So, um, Dr. Rahimala, thank you for, uh, I'm struck by your underscoring the different ways that individuals present and therefore the different, you know, approaches that have to be considered. I want to invite our panelists um, to the conversation here. We are bringing uh, four additional folks into the conversation, and so I'm so glad to see all of you joining us on the screen. So joining us, we have Deanna Burkholder, who is a peer care coordinator with the North Carolina uh, Health Alliance. Welcome, Deanna. We also have Dr. Jerry Carroll, who is program director for the EMS Fellowship at Cooper University Hospital. Dr. Gail D'Onofrio, who is the Albert E. Kent Professor of Emergency Medicine and Professor of Medicine and Public Health at the Yale School of Medicine, and rounding us out, uh, Dr. Michael A. Smith, a Clinical Associate Professor in the Department of Clinical Pharmacy at the University of Michigan College of Pharmacy, and also a Clinical Pharmacist in Pain and Palliative Care at Michigan Medicine. So we are going to have a conversation among um, the five of you. I want to turn first, Dr. D'Onofrio, would you tell us more about your experience initiating buprenorphine in the emergency department and just a little bit of illustration how that might be different from other hospital experiences? Sure. So um, my experience is that um, through a um, NIDA and NIH HEAL um, ED initiative, we um, are looking at sublingual versus the CAM 2038, which is Brooksville um, seven day injectable. And we have now as of today enrolled over 1500 patients. And we have had 10 cases of precipitated withdrawal in 28 sites all across the country. So we are not seeing, I, I shouldn't say we're not seeing, we're seeing the same patients. In fact, our patients are probably a, a lot more seriously ill and having different types of um, co-occurring illnesses, et cetera. But we are quite capable of initiating buprenorphine um, with very few side effects. Um, the things that I think that we do well is that if patients are um, not feeling better or they're feeling a little worse, we give them even more buprenorphine. And so we can easily get people up to 24 milligrams during their period of time with us, or we could use some ancillary medications um, if we need to. 
in the unlikely event, the less than 1% that develop precipitated withdrawal, we can treat them very effectively and we've shown how to do that. In our last one, um, I unfortunately had in my institution by me, um, I could treat in a couple of hours and they were doing fine. So um, we do know how to treat that and get them out, but clearly it was precipitated withdrawal. Um, so I would say that really we can just treat it very quickly. And if there is any comment, it's more bup is better than less bup. And I'm just gonna go right out there and say that. We cannot, as an outpatient providers, ever give low what's considered low dosing because that requires individuals to use illicit drugs. So I would be saying, go out and use another dose of fentanyl, in which case I could kill you. So we will never do that. One thing we could do if that was ever allowed by the FDA is give a pharmaceutical dose of morphine, for example, over periods of time, along with a patch. Again, the patch would be the best. And so if we could get the patch, you know, approved for OUD and get it in a reasonable um, amount of money, then we could do that. And that could be very a great option for people. And when patients are being admitted to the hospital, there's whole kinds of things that could be done. The only thing that's really serious is that patients who are going into the hospital are, you know, have co-occurring substance use disorder or other problems, and they generally don't stay long in the hospital. So these long protocols will never work. They're all going out and then I'm seeing them back in a day. So it's, um, it's important we straighten this out and we could, it's it's very different for different people, but but people should but clinicians and patients should not be uh, worried about abuse induction because we can do it very well in our setting, and we should not be re we should not be fearful of that. And if should the unlikely case that we do precipitate withdrawal, we can treat it. But quite truthfully, it's not any different than what we were doing. 10 years ago without fentanyl. We did put people in precipitated withdrawal there in a small amount, and we will continue to do it, but we learned how to treat it. Um, and I would just say that because our population is so much more vulnerable than it's ever been before. 50% of our patients uh, have unstable housing. Only 20% of, of them are employed. Very few of them have educations that can get jobs so that we it, it's just we have to deal with all of this as well as their addiction. And so it's a complicated it's a complicated route. Mm -hmm. Right. That it's a, there's a, there are many considerations in that in that approach. Um, I, I want to turn to Dr. Carroll. Um, Tell us about your experience initiating buprenorphine within emergency medical services. Um, how is it different from what we heard from Dr. Rahimala and Dr. D D Dr. D'Onofrio? Um, so really dovetailing off of Gail's kind of work there, we kind of built a similar ED bridge program here at Cooper um, and emulated a lot of that. And again, like she said, it's just not microinduction is great for the outpatient arena. Um, there is that huge challenge of what we're telling people to do while they're still using opiates. Um, and then if you translate the ED experience into the pre-hospital experience, all of that gets more challenging, right? So, and there's really two models in the pre-hospital world. I wanna talk about the latter. The first is kind of this mobile integrated healthcare or community paramedicine, where you're really moving outside of the 911 system and having paramedics visiting and doing almost like community health worker activities and visiting nurse activities. And then the second where you're actually repurposing or increasing the purpose of 911 units at on overdose calls and other opiate complications. Um, and the kind of critical thing there, you had to teach both that engagement piece, which all healthcare providers really need to learn in this space, and then just the actual much more easily taught pharmacology of medication for opiate use disorder. Um, and things we found, again, is it needed to be rapid, right? This is, there's 911 calls holding everywhere. You can't tell an EMS service that they're going to spend hours on scene with this patient population. So we had, we opted for a high dose induction. Um, typically, we, not typically, we induce with 16 milligrams. Um, and within 10 minutes, we'll go to 24 milligrams. So very high doses based on traditional. Um, interestingly, for the 200 cases we've had, plus another about 150 I'm aware of around the country, some of that data published, some of it not. We have had really no precipitated withdrawal. We think that may be linked that all of these patients have had naloxone first. And there's some I, really interesting like pharmacologic reasons for that, but none of them proven. So it's not worth getting into with my few minutes. Um, but 
I think that's pretty safe and it's been pretty exciting stuff. Um, the other big thing, which is hard pre-hospital and hard for the emergency department, is that you need somewhere for these patients to go, right? Us act, operating in a vacuum is just you know, not useful. When we started this program, we had like a six points crazy diagram to get people to follow up. Now, Monday through Friday, you can walk into the same place, which has been hard to like reproduce as we spread this around the country. Um, on the FDA side and what we need as far as medications, the hardest thing is that we're doing high doses and high doses don't exist, right? I have to put two sublingual films or worse, two tablets under your tongue right after I woke you up from an overdose, had this very difficult conversation while you're still looking for whether you got robbed or what else happened while we, before we got there. And hopefully you will not throw up from your withdrawal that we induced while I try to get this absorbed. So a one film and, and 16 milligrams could be super useful for us. An IV formulation, which I don't have a lot of experience with, is also very interesting to me. But those are, I think, avenues where we can kind of expand this um, and actually really get, because again, like Dr. D'Onofrio said, this is the sickest population, right? This patient has no resources, chronically homeless, no support system. By the time you end up in some of these inner city areas overdosing, you've kind of hit that end stage opiate use disorder. And so we need to be a little bit more aggressive, in my opinion. So that's kind of a good three, hopefully three minutes. It was perfect and and uh, helpful in in context about when the products are being used and what would what might be helpful in in additional product i i want to turn then um let's turn to the hot the pharmacist perspective um dr smith what can you tell us about hospital-based buprenorphine initiation from the from the pharmacist perspective yeah so can you hear me with this microphone or no okay. uh yeah it's okay. you're good Good. Um, so I, I think the first thing from a pharmacist perspective, one is, uh, can Actually we get, get a tiny bit closer? Sure. I think from the pharmacist perspective, the, the first thing is, is it safe? Like what's the safest way to do this for the patient? And then the next is how do we get the drug that we're choosing to the patient in terms of delivery? Um, I think Dr. Rahimullah brought up some good points about the low dose initiation problems you really can't cut Subutex more than in half because it just disintegrates. Um, and so that's one issue. So we really actually shy away from that. Um, the other is how do we get patients to the doses uh, as fast as we can that we are looking for? Um, and we're, we're here actually moving away from the transdermal product because we've looked at our data versus in other institutions and found that uh, there was really no difference. The only reason we got to doses higher doses faster is because we were just using higher doses of Suboxone faster. Um, and so I think really for us, it's a matter of uh, somewhat using the gray area to our advantages. And as an example, we recently had a case of a patient with head and neck cancer um, who we really needed to use buprenorphine in, but the concern was there wasn't sublingual space. Well, we used it anyway, right? Because although they didn't have a tongue, they had the vasculature there in order to absorb the drug. So I think it's trying to be creative in ways with the drugs that are available in, in, in current form and, and thinking about how you can skirt around some of those issues. And one of the other ones that was brought up was the expense of a Butrans patch. Uh, it's $150 at a minimum for a box of four. No pharmacy is going to cut that box just to give somebody one patch when they can't give somebody else the other three. Um, and so really having flexibility in, in the formulations to give the doses that we need like the very high dose in a single formulation or very low dose in a single formulation. I think that spectrum is important. And those are the things that really, from my perspective, is what we're trying to think through is because I, I think Gail said this best is more buprenorphine is better, but any buprenorphine is better than zero. And so get it on, get it started and understand your your the cons to your approach so you can anticipate them and, and manage around them. Yeah. So, uh, helpful reminder that in the interim there are things we can can do with the existing dosage forms um but recognizing that that there's certainly an, an opportunity for for additional ones i'm gonna i'm gonna come back to that idea of um whether the currently available formulations are 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 enough to meet the needs of patients but you've already started to answer that so keep thinking on that diana we want to bring your voice to the the conversation here um, as a peer care coordinator in an inpatient setting, what strategies for buprenorphine initiation have you seen work well? 
So what's worked best for our patients members is um, initially having them partnered up with a peer support specialist. So somebody who has lived experience, who's in recovery from um, not necessarily opioid use disorder, but substance use disorder, who can say, I've been to a clinic, I've been kind of where you've been. Um, And this helps the patient be able to have a voice to help them advocate for themselves, whether that's communicating with the provider, Maybe the patient isn't sure um, what kind of questions to ask or how to say, this is what I want, or this is what I feel like I need. Um, Because a lot of these folks, like um, the other people we're talking about, are um, underserved, vulnerable populations that don't have a lot of confidence and advocacy for themselves. So um, initially having a peer, we think has worked really, really well. Another um, aspect to it is that after having options, right? (laughs) The more clinics, the better. So here in Northern Colorado, we have eight clinics that have 11 locations and they also do pop-up clinics, mobile clinics. You can get initiated on this life-changing medication um, same or next day, every day of the week. That is so important to what we do here. And we feel like it's um, been able to reach patients that we just wouldn't have you wouldn't have even known where to start with. Um, For example, I had a 15 year old client who um, she was in the emergency department and couldn't get dosed for their protocols um, because she wasn't in withdrawal. Again, I'm not the expert on the um, emergency department side, but she didn't get initiated. But we have so many community supports. So she was able able to get referred to a peer at the North Colorado Health Alliance that set her up with an addiction treatment services appointment the very next day, met her there. She got induced and is now actually doing the sublocate shot, which see, you know, that just breaking down those barriers for for patients. You know, she's a, a high school student. And so taking strips in the middle of the day might be a barrier for her. And so we don't want that. Um, We definitely just want to break down as many of those barriers as possible. And so definitely just having access to the clinics, access to peers, um, and support in and outside of clinics once they're started on buprenorphine. And once they continue that with the clinic is, is really what we've seen work well. That's great, um, Deanna. And, 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 um, well, such a good, always good to hear the, yes, we've found a, a, a solution there. Um, I want to turn this question to everybody. You've, you've all actually all already said we could use some additional formulations to meet the need of patients. So who wants to jump in and say what, you know, what other formulations would be most helpful in, to, in terms of whether it's dosage, route of administration, duration of effect, Who's going to fire off and unmute first for me? Gail, you're unmuted. Then I'm going to Michael. Okay, fine. So there are a lot. I'll just say that just as other other speakers have demonstrated, we need them at low doses. So we need like small dosing so we don't have to cut up the the um, the film. So that's that's great. We need the patches available and the FDA approval of those and a single dose patch at a time. We mm-hmm. also need... Um, the seven day injectable. And I don't, you know, I don't want to say with the company or anything, but it's under, um, it's still under um, FDA. um, It's not under FDA approval quite yet because of exclusivity um, and some other reasons. We need that approved because we can initiate that. We've been doing it easily with a Cal scores of four. And we know that we can do it even with people without in without withdrawal, but in certain circumstances. So um, that would be a great thing for an ED to be able to uh, administer. Patients seem to like it. It's a very small injection. They're not making commitment for thirty days. And the way the far, the way that the pharmacokinetics of it are is that it takes um, a while for it to reach um, to really two nanograms per milli, about four hours later than a sublingual. So it's um, it, it's great. It's not like sublicate that's immediate, which is hard to use right away um, in low levels of withdrawal. So it's a great thing to start with and then to 
um, transition people to the supplicate at another time. There are people we could use supplicate with in the ED, but those are for unusual circumstances. So I would say we need all of that. And I'll let um, the other thing, though, I just want to say quickly is because um, Diona, you said this, um, you know, the FDA packaging is still that buprenorphine cannot be used under the age of 16, although we do um, outside it. And so I would also suggest that we work on that, that we should be able to, under an addiction specialist, we can, we can start it in an ED, but under an addiction specialist, it should be able to be used in all teenagers. It should not be regardless of age. All right. Uh, so we've got our it. list. If we yep. study, we have to do it under IND, and we would really like not to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We've got our list started. Michael, what are you going to add to the list? I think we have the routes right. I think that's fine. Sublingual, IV, we have the implant. I think we have the routes. I think it's a matter of dosage form and packaging as part of it, right, which we've already kind of discussed, and in and, and the way that a patient is going to use it. I think the other kind of limiting factors are... Uh, regulatory related, the package inserts and the um, number of concerns and side effects and warnings and precautions are, I, I think, need to be re-examined, like QT prolongation as one example. Um, I think age is another. Uh, as Gail pointed out, we actually used it, uh, used Suboxone in an 11-year-old. Um, it was for pain, but it was still safe. I think the safety aspect is we've kind of touched on it, um, but it's wildly safe relative to everything else. It's it's inc an incredibly safe drug to use, and I don't think we're touting that enough. I think we're being held back by it. Um, and, and, and so I think some of those things really need to be addressed because there are limitations around insurance coverage, and, and some of that definitely is driven through the package insert and what is available there. Um, and with these new approaches, we're seeing less and less side effects um, from that. But I, I, like I said, I think we have the routes. I think it's about getting better dosage within those routes that we can give to patients. Okay. And uh, Dr. Carroll, because uh, I think I heard in your presentation a higher dose. Was that right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, a challenge of all the sublingual formulations is the time of absorption. This is both clear in the outpatient arena, right? Patients often take it incorrectly. They're not patient about it. Um, and then the more films you're asking people to take, I mean, it's a bad taste. There's all kinds of different, you know, psycho, you know, psychosocial challenges with that. So a 16 milligram film would be huge. Um, I think th the other big thing is the challenge of the seven day um, injection is super exciting. I think there's a right there's a, every time I consult with people about doing a rural EMS program or ED program, they don't have that follow up piece, and they're never going to have it. Not in seven days, not in 24 hours, maybe in seven days, maybe in 30 days. Um, but both the approval of that, and then also just the cost. Right? Um, we give supplicate in our emergency department to a select group. Um, we have a reallocation program with one of the local Medicaid's. Um, but it's a small population, but it's great for some of our most unstable patients who we have not otherwise been able to induce successfully due to a lot of different reasons. Um, but at $2,000 or more, right, that's not a tenable, you know, no one's going to carry that on an ambulance and hope that we can give it out. Like, it's just not going to work. Um, so those are the other challenges. But I don't disagree with um, the idea that we have the routes down, but I think absorption rates and the amount in those doses could definitely make a big difference for what we can do. And then it's always cost, which is hard. I know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one thing to piggyback really quick that you just brought up is taste. Um, we've had to switch patients between products because of taste, or we've actually, whether or not we should have co-administered with hard candy. Um, and so I think dealing with that taste in some form, whether there's studies on what you can co-administer it with or that won't affect absorption or changing the taste of it would be really important because those are low barriers, but they're still barriers that people don't enjoy. And if there's a way around it, we should work around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That co-administration with hard candy is a fascinating idea, uh, component there. Dr. Himala, I want to invite you and it Anything you want to highlight here, put on our list? Yeah, absolutely. Taste <clears throat> taste is a big one. If we can change that, that'd be great. And um, with transdermal patches, like we mentioned, patches being FDA approved for pain and opioid use disorder, uh, coming up with patches that are inexpensive, um, figuring out ways to get these covered by insurance. 
And then sublingual buprenorphine uh, preparations, 0.5 milligrams is what is what is used most commonly, and in the reported case reports in the case series. And uh, the lowest available dose that we have commercially is two milligrams. Um, 0 0.4, 0 0.2 milligrams formulations exist in other countries. So 0 0.5 milligrams requires us to cut the two milligram forms into a quarter. 0 0.25 milligrams requires us to do it, uh, cut it in, in an eighth. So again, just reinforcing that smaller uh, uh, formulations would really facilitate this. And then, you know, I agree with what everybody said, and I want to reinforce that Low dose inductions are not uh, are used in only sp specific and special circumstances. Oftentimes, when standard inductions and high dose inductions can't be used, and mm. um, you know they shouldn't. Low dose induction shouldn't be used in any in sort of cookie cutter manner, and it's really w almost like a last resort when when other inductions can't be used. Okay, so thinking about the paradigm is when you can yeah. do a higher, mm -hmm. do the higher. Yeah. It's yeah. only when you need to do the lower. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Patients in withdrawal, let's go directly into induction. Patients who are going to develop withdrawal soon, let's wait and go directly into an induction and not prolong. And let, you know, of course, not asking patients to use illicit opioids, illicit fentanyl, along with uh, a low dose induction and putting them at risk of an overdose. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask one follow-up question on the, the packaging, and this is going to come to you, Dr. Smith. Uh, you mentioned that the patches are in a, a box of four, and so part of the, then um, do you ever split those boxes, or it's generally you wouldn't? No. Yeah. So, yeah, so that if, if, if it's split, they come in a pack of four because that's a one-month supply for right. a pain indication. So if it is split, that pharmacy is then left with three patches out of box that's not a month supply. And so they either have to continue splitting and they may not have that, or they lose out on hundreds of dollars of drug on their end as well. So having, and this isn't the only product that's like that. This is just within the scope, but if it, it, the it's already prepackaged for a month supply. So, and we're not using that month supply in these settings. That's only for the pain indication. So I, I think which a, with an additional indication of opioid use disorder would also need to come an additional packaging so that it could be delivered in the same way that we would want to be using it, which would be one patch. Right, right. Because you'd need that for the information, right? The package labeling that would need to come with it. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else on formulations? Because then I'm going to turn Deanna... Um, how about safe storage of buprenorphine? What do you hear from, from patients about the storage considerations? So we, we have a lot of um, members that we work with that use the locking pill bottles, the plastic container that has the locking mechanism on the cap. So to keep it safe from, you know, children, pets, whatever. Um, but honestly, there there hasn't been a lot of concern from um, people that I know using the medication, cutting strips, storing them afterwards about the efficacy of the medication. There doesn't seem to be any kind of, um, you know, argument that my cut strip isn't as effective as a whole strip. You know, it's just obviously the amount of medication that they're taking at one time. Um, but overall, I don't, I don't have um too much you know, from the from the people taking the medication that I work with. I haven't heard a whole lot about safe storage concerns, honestly. Okay. Well that's if you haven't heard that that's part of the answer too, right? Uh yes. <laughs> great. So then let's um talk a bit and I want to say this is this back to everybody and and would love to start with you, um, Dr. Rahimala, and then and then turn to you, Diana. Um if we're thinking about the use of buprenorphine, in addition to that, what other forms of support do you offer patients? Is that adjunctive medication, social support, kind of, uh, you, you've all mentioned that it's more than just getting an active pharmaceutical ingredient into an individual. It's a broader question. So Dr. Himalo, would you take a shot at that first? Yeah, absolutely. You know, keeping in with the spirit of getting people on buprenorphine maintenance and um, 
going through induction processes, buprenorphine is used directly in the induction process, but also other adjunctive medications can be used in order to relieve any excess withdrawal that's occurring that's not being treated immediately by that induction process. So we shouldn't be shy away from using supportive medications in order to serve that greater good of getting people onto buprenorphine and buprenorphine maintenance. And in terms of other support, absolutely, when patients are going through withdrawal, having a peer support specialist or having our substance use navigator come in and talk with patients and provide them support to keep them motivated and encourage them to keep moving forward is incredibly important in the hospital and then um, following up with them after the hospital and then linking them to ongoing care. And do you, are, are, are there situations where you have um, folks who have like the anticipatory anxiety of, uh, of, 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 of starting buprenorphine? How, how does that, factor in and and how do you think through that yeah and, uh, absolutely. gail's gonna jump in yeah, yeah go yeah, ahead yeah gail might be might is the best to answer this question but what I, what i'll say is that not all anxiety or sometimes withdrawal symptoms um can be confounded just by anticipatory anxiety and just requiring the patient to wait until the buprenorphine gets kicked in uh, until it kinks in it's not necessarily precipitated withdrawal. So, you know, all withdrawal is not precipitated withdrawal. And oftentimes there's solutions to that as well, just continuing to give higher doses of buprenorphine in order to manage it. But I'll, I'll let um, Gail and others discuss that. Yeah, so I was just going to mention two things. Thank you for um, saying that because there is so much anxiety in patients who are using lots of fentanyl. They use it repetitively during the day. They're very anxious if they can't get a hold of it. And so sometimes people misinterpret withdrawal signs from their generalized anxiety. So sometimes off the top of my head, I often say, maybe they need a little bit of Ativan first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> say, chill out. It, when you're ready, we'll be ready to provide it for you. So I think that's why sometimes people misinterpret the um, withdrawal signs from generalized anxiety. On the other hand, there is also um, really a, a lot of anxiety about butte because people keep saying this constantly. Oh, in the air of fentanyl, we can't give out butte. That is wrong. And I wish we were not saying that. We do need to be careful and uh, understand everything, but that is not true that bupe does not work in the era of fentanyl. It does work very well. So one of the things we do in the ED, or at least I try to tell people is, this is what we know. It rarely happens. It does happen, but we will tell you that we will not leave you. If, if this happens, we know how to treat it and we're not going to let you go until you feel better. And in the ED that often requires, since people are homeless, keeping them overnight, you're not going to let them go out in the street feeling badly. So we do in this precipitated withdrawal that happened to me just in the last few weeks, you know, it happened pretty quickly in the evening. But by 11 o'clock, it was fine. And but the person stayed overnight. I saw them first thing in the morning. They were ready to go. They got their morning dose. So it, it's a matter of just saying, I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to be here. I, I know how to treat this. And um, we're going to do this together. And I can't promise you, but it's, it's a small percentage, but I'll be here. And that's what we say to people to try to allay their fears of initiating you. But you're right, you have to be very careful that it's people are not using that anxiety and those subjective symptoms as withdrawal. I think that's what happens, and then people start bup much too early. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Deanna, you unmuted. I just wanted to add to that. I'm, I have talked to many members who are hesitant in it, getting started on the medication because they are facing, um, like, Dr. Gale just said the uh, misinformation of it's not going to work for me. I only do fentanyl. And so really um, talking to those, those members and just like the, the community as a whole, right. To get it out there that we know naloxone, kind of the same idea. We know naloxone works. Um, it might not be as immediate on somebody who's struggling with fentanyl, but kind of the same with, you know, that, that it will work. Some is better than none. And, um, 
getting that concept out to our members, as well as assuring them um, working with the, the unhoused population, working with the unemployed, working with a lot of folks who don't have phones, who don't have, you know, I know I live in New York, but I don't, I couldn't tell you what block, you know, it depends on the day. And so how am I going to get to my clinic? How am I, you know, cause this is a medication you, you once you start, you have to continue um, and make those appointments and continue with those community services. So we like to offer um, assistance with transportation, assistance with Medicaid co-pays for these unhoused um, and unsheltered folks and people that um, are hugely benefiting from it. So pretty much anything that could be a barrier. Um, we try to put to rest right away so that they're willing to initiate and even just go meet with somebody at a clinic um, and talk to somebody and get kind of the facts on how life changing it could be for them. And like I said, whether that's transportation, um, gift cards to help pay for co-pays or somebody to go with you, whatever those barriers are so that way they aren't afraid to start something and they feel like they're supported in their ability to continue to stay on the medication. Yeah, uh, so thinking the there's the initiation and then the, it, it, it's the start of a journey and and continuing through. Uh, Dr. Smith, do you want to jump in? Because I've got a specific question I want to run to Dr. Carroll as well. Yeah, well, I, I, I also think it's just rehashing how safe it is. I think that Gail pointed out in her other data, you know, very few withdrawal, the her paper in JAMA was very few precipitated withdrawal cases. There's ways around withdrawal and there's ways to treat it. And it's it's just an extremely safe medication to use. And I think highlighting that it's safe first is really important. And then it's effective. We know it's effective. There's lots and lots of data that says it's effective, whether it's retrospective or randomized control trials in all settings, it's effective, but it's also wildly, wildly safe for patients. They, sh they should have very little concerns from a safety perspective of taking the drug because we know how to manage those things and, and manage them well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can hear wildly safe resonating with uh, with a number of the folks who are, who are watching today. Um, Dr. Carroll, I'm struck that in right in your environment it may be naloxone and then buprenorphine and then it, you know you t you're kind of in and out and and so talk to us a little bit about the uh, adjunctive medication or social support or or the realities that it's you know it's a little different in the emergency not a little it's different in the emergency medicine in the ems space yeah, both in the emergency department and especially in EMS, those resources are hard to come by. Um, in the emergency department, there's more and more resources, um, though it's not standardized across the ERs. It's very variable where you could, you know, if I have chest pain, what will happen to me in one ER versus another is pretty, you know, pretty very similar. If I come in and withdrawal, very, very different. Um, both not even just if you get care or where you'll be sent, will there actually be, op you know, medication for opioid use disorder in those rehabs? Will they actually link you or just release you back onto the street after all of that is kind of a big mess in the field. We're really the only option is the emergency department. Um, and what really built our EMS program and what is kind of going nationwide is that this patient population has been marginalized in healthcare for a lot of reasons and has no interest. I mean, going to the emergency department isn't fun for anyone. And it's especially not fun for this population. And so over a five year period here in the city, we saw our refusal rate after an overdose go from like three to 5% to over 50%. Um, and that's kind of being mirrored across the country, which means EMS is the only healthcare provider for these patients in extremis. So as far as the adjunctive medications, EMS has a much more limited toolbox for pharmacy. And I think rightly so. Um, we do provide Ondansetron or Zofran for nausea um, but that's really the only thing besides the Suboxone and then just kind of restoring dignity and comfort and engagement, um, which is one of the reasons, like I said, we talked about formulations. We need some way to get people beyond that. I and mean, even on the weekend, we still have that challenge. And if you don't want to go to the ED, I don't have a whole lot to offer you. Um, I guess on the FDA side of things and also just on DEA issues, there's no dispensing, right? It would be great on a Friday to dispense for strips. So they could follow up on Monday, right? Um, we're already there. You're in direct communication with the physician or can be. So there's huge options there that regula regulations don't allow us to do. Um, I always say for each one of these lectures, I put up a strange call behind me because I'm an EMS guy. But this is somebody, we, this is a call where it was an accident. We induced the patient who overdosed, crashed, caused a six car pileup, and then 
started Suboxone. So it's one of my favorite pictures. Um, but anyway, just my thoughts there. Um, the power of visual, right? Thank you. Um, and and helpful on the, uh, uh, you know, what's available and the ability to, to dispense and, and thinking through that. You uh, trigger me then to think, um, so what else do we need to research? What are our remaining knowledge gaps to inform guideline development and product development? Um, what, what are the priority areas where we need to do some um, additional research? Uh, so maybe I should say, Dr. D'Onofrio, what do you have in the queue or what do you wish you had in the queue um, for research in this space? Well, we have a bunch in the queue. First of all, we're hoping that we will be funded very shortly for a high dose protocol. Um, and uh, as in comparison with our standard, and our standard dosing is at least eight milligrams, eight to 12 during the day. And then um, our high dose would be at least 20, would be 24 milligrams, just initiating people right off the bat. I think, you know, um, Dr. Herring and I did publish something. It was a retrospective um, report out of uh, Highland of all the individuals in the past year that he had and in, really inducted with high dose because there had been nothing else previously. And we considered high dose 12 and over since that's what we've been doing. Um, and we found it very safe and it happened very quickly and we were able to do it. That was a retrospective study in one place. So we're going to do a multi-centered study um, looking at high dose versus standard dose. That's one thing. We're hoping to work with Dr. Carroll on an EMS um, protocol that we've we've um, applied for in the basic sense of that into kind of looking for a Delphi consensus because there are only a couple of places doing it. Everybody does something different. So what should we do in the field? And then how would we evaluate that? That would be really important to get everybody else on board. And the other thing we're looking at is adolescence, really, and treatment of adolescence. And that's a hard lift with uh, with everyone because one, we have to get rid of the insert that says that you can't do it. So we would have to go under IND there. So that while there are few in each institution, as you've seen, the adolescents are the ones who are dying. Um, many because of overdose um, that have opioid disorder and many who have don't even really know they're taking an opioid. That is an inadvertent ingestion that they're taking something else. So there needs to be work in that space with adolescents. And that's a difficult space to get into. Um, and that's why people avoid it because it's so difficult. Um, but we need to get into that space. So I'll just, I'll stop there and let everybody, but I also want to say telemedicine, you know, we've, we now have a reprieve only until November, but we need to continue telemedicine because imagine all those rural areas, imagine people that just um, don't have cars. Are you going to take three buses and whatever? Imagine new mothers, you want to keep them with their children and they have to go somewhere, which is why bup works so much better, by the way, if you can use bup and not methadone, because we can give you 30 days and 60 days and then again, we have to make sure that the pharmacists are not reporting these people as questionable, which is also what's happening to individuals who are going to try to fill their prescriptions. So we need that. We need more um, telemedicine if we have to research it more, whatever, to get people to realize how important that is for our communities. Uh, lots of research to, to tick off there from the high dose to the adolescent to uh, understanding and how we diffuse things in the EMS space. Other thoughts about research priorities? Anybody else want to jump on there with? Yep. Go ahead, Dr. Smith. Yeah, I think just highlighting two of the things is we know that pediatrics have different pharmacokinetic properties from buprenorphine. They clear the drug faster. So we don't know would high dose work for them or would they need like BID dosing for it because of the differences there. We need more research in that area for sure to better understand. We know that when it's been used, it's been safe, but we don't know the right dosing for those patient populations. I think that's big. And and Dr. Carroll brought this up too, but I think it's important to highlight is we talked about right-sizing the package formulation for individuals taking like a smaller dose of a film or a higher dose of a film or a single patch. But like Dr. Carroll said, like, what about a 72 hour dispensation thing that could be given to somebody to get them through a weekend or whatever it is? Like, I think that those transitions are where we lose a lot of people. So are there ways to study 
how to improve our transitions, whether it's packaging or supportive services or even billing availability for peer support or whatever it is. There's there's lots of ways that we need to research supporting patients during those transitions because that's where they're the most vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, and I, I um, am hearing you on on the um, kind of the the com- Components in, in the connection, and I'm struck, uh, Dr. Himala, when you you put up kind of your first slide was about let's remember the goal of induction is is maintenance, <laughs> right? And and keeping folks on it, and so that idea of connecting the initiation to the longer term piece um, is is there a way to to help with that? I'm struck, um, Dr. Smith, on the the adolescent. Um, difference in clearing. Do we have any um, issues on the other end um, with with older adults, or it, it's it, um, we know we know more there? Do we have any gaps in research on the 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 other end of the age spectrum? I mean, we certainly have gaps in the geriatric spectrum for sure. Um, I think I don't think it's as glaring um, for several reasons. One, they're more well studied. Two. There are less of the population that are that are suffering from opioid use disorder. I think the pediatric population is more of a focus. But in the in the older adults, like buprenorphine is so uh, so safe in that space that even you know patients that require dialysis, it's stable. I mean, those are the things that we would face in older adults. So we know more about it in that space than we do relative to pediatric patients. Okay, okay, really helpful. Thank you. Um, so we're to our last five minutes of this panel where I want to say, I want I'm going to give you all an opportunity to say, what do you want to, is there something that you wanted to say that you didn't get a chance to? And uh, if you'll have that opportunity, and then what do you want to highlight or underscore and say, you know, what, what, what do you want people to take home from this discussion as, as most important, either in a need or a consideration, or what would you want to highlight from what we talked about here? Deanna, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to go you, Dr. Carol, Dr. Rahimala. Deanna. Um, the one thing that I didn't get a chance to bring up that I wanted to talk about was the availability of the current formulations in pharmacies. So that same um, adolescent that I was working with, she uh, had gotten an appointment on a Friday, went to pick up her prescription at a pharmacy and they didn't have it. So they sent it to another pharmacy and that pharmacy wouldn't release it to her because they didn't have her doctor authorization. And this is in the evening. And so this young person had to get dosed at an ED over the weekend. And then that's when we came back the next week and decided Sublocade was the way to go because it is uh, easiest for her lifestyle. And so the the barriers. So that was something I wanted to say. I'm not quite sure um, exactly where that fits into the conversation, but I've heard that twice now of a pharmacy not being able, not having a certain prescription and actually had a provider talk with um, a member of mine about you know, that it's very common that the pharmacy is out of this. And so are you willing to try this? Um, and I, I obviously that's not um, what we like to hear. We want to hear person centered and that that person is getting what they feel they need and the provider is able to prescribe what they feel the person needs versus um, what's available. Um, and I know there are workarounds for both of those things. And then um, the biggest takeaway I would just like folks to get out of this is um exactly what Dr. I'm going to butcher it. Rama, I'm not even going to Rahimala, try. that's all right. <laughs> what he, you know, in the slides of um, initiation is we do initiation for ongoing care. You know, we, we initiate these folks, not just to get them past their overdose or to get them past their withdrawal that they're in the emergency department for. Ultimately, the goal is to get these folks into long-term recovery or at least connected with services that they're not going to return to heavy opioid use disorder. Um, And that initiation is the first step of that. Great. Thank you, Deanna. Dr. Carroll. Yeah, two things. I think on the research side of the FDA focus of medication, I think on the emergency side of things, the focus on rapid induction, whether it's IV or sublingual forms and the size of the dose is going to be critical. And then that second piece, researching how we bridge people to long-term care when we don't have availability. I think more globally in this crisis, you get on these kinds of panels and I'm like, we've solved this. The opioid crisis is done. But when you realize it and you think about this group, 
the majority of the country has no access to what we're talking about. Um, and so I think, especially on the emergency side of things, emergency department care, I think the data is in, and this ought to, just like chest pain, you should walk into any ED and this should be available to you and that needs to start being pushed out. I think EMS will be there shortly. Um, and I think it needs to be like, it can't be that I just moved one town to another and suddenly my care is completely different. And so I think that's the theme. I think all of different healthcare, including non-traditional places where you didn't expect this EMS being an emergency department being two places. I never thought I would be doing addiction care while less before it's certified in uh, two emergencies, right? But um, as we've kind of like leveraged the healthcare system in different ways, we now need to standardize that kind of problem solving you know, longitudinally across the country. So that's my thoughts. Yep. Make it, normalize it, right? Got to have it consistent. All right. Dr. Rahimala, Dr. D'Onofrio, Dr. Smith, we'll let you have the last word. Dr. Rahimala. Yeah. So takeaway from my presentation would be that for low dose inductions, having FDA approval for patches for pain and mm -hmm. opioid use disorder, creating patches that are inexpensive, you know, and would facilitate these low dose inductions and also sublingual buprenorphine forms that would be low enough to um, um, facilitate these inductions. And then also having clarity around when it's okay to do these inductions and when it's not okay to do these inductions, when a high dose and a standard induction is, is more appropriate. The other thing I'd say is just piggybacking on you know, of course, more research in adolescence, that's wonderful. And then also the telemedicine thing. We have a lot of telemedicine companies and telemedicine um, protocols that are in works to improve follow-up for buprenorphine on discharge and then just access to buprenorphine in general and, you know, repealing that or not really having certainty of that being a stable option in the future is going to really... Um, prohibit growth in that. Um, we're just getting started with that. And it's really going to be a big step back if we don't have a stable future to allow those things to continue to grow. Um, and yes, we have a treatment gap. We, we have a huge treatment gap. So we need to continue to have options and clarity around which options are make the most sense in which scenarios. Excellent. So more options and then understanding how to how to use them. All right, Dr. D'Onofrio, Dr. Smith, and then we're going to go to our break. Sure, I don't have uh, much else to add. I think it's been a great discussion and everybody has focused on a lot of different things. Um, I wish that there would be some quality measures put forth. Mm. I know we do that a lot from CMS and in in that's in the older populations, but I wish we could have some really federal quality measurements so that we could um, push this forward. It, it isn't... Um, an option for people to want to treat. It should be like everything else. It is evidence-based. Every ED should do it. Every hospital should do it. Every community should have these resources. And I wish we could put some more teeth into those um, and that therefore we could do better. And the regulatory issues around EMS are enormous because when you've seen one system, you've seen one system and they're state regulated, sometimes county regulated in my state. So the more we could do to standardize certain things throughout the U.S., the better that would be. Awesome. Um, all right, Dr. Smith, last word, and then we'll run to break. Sure, and I'll be real quick. I think highlighting safety, remembering that, and I think um, – Piggybacking Deanna's point, uh, reducing barriers. There's a group from Texas looking at pharmacy-related barriers, and I think a lot of it has to do with misunderstanding of the drugs and, and misunderstanding of the patient population. Yeah. Yes. All right. We will remember wildly safe. All right, everyone. Thank you so much um, for joining us today, for sharing your insight. We're going to go to a quick break, and we will return in eight minutes at the top of the hour. But thank you so much for joining us for the conversation and for what you do every day. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you took the opportunity to refresh and recharge before we settle into our next session. We're now going to turn to Dr. Michelle Lafwell, who is going to kick off session three. She is a board sort of she is board certified in psychiatry and addiction medicine and serves as professor in the departments of behavioral science and psychiatry and the Bell Alcohol and Addictions Adowd Chair at the University of Kentucky. 
We are now talking about buprenorphine initiation and maintenance in the community setting. Dr. Lofwell, I'm going to step away from the stage and let you step right up. here with you and to be talking to you today about buprenorphine um, in the communities and we'll talk about dosing and beyond. Our outline for today's talk, <clears throat> as you'll see on the next slide, is going to cover multiple phases. Um, next slide. From what we've initially have always talked about, initiation, maintenance, stabilization, discontinuation, tapering, and of course, lots of other strategies um, to help people get and stay into treatment. And we're going to talk about some pharmacological factors as we go through, but also lots of non-pharmacological factors that you won't be surprised to hear about if you heard the previous two talks and discussion, and then we'll conclude. Next. Factors to consider when initiating, um, really important factors because we know initiation in the first 30 days, lots of dropout. So be thinking about what are the patient's preferences? What are the basic needs of the patient? Do they have food, housing, transportation? These are all things that we think of as social determinants of health, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It will impact whether they can get to you and whether they can come back. The healthcare system, of course, we're interested in who can pay for the medication. Is it on the formulary? And will the pharmacy have it? We know that there are some pharmacies that just will not stock sublingual buprenorphine. This is published. And of course, pharmacy access is more challenging with um, the injectable because of the um, complicated REMS distribution. Housing status and their rules. Where is your outpatient living? Interestingly, um, we're seeing some jails actually bring their inmates to us in the context of having some settlements um, for violations of the ADA for not allowing patients to continue on the medication. So this is a really incredible opportunity to try and get treatment into our criminal justice um, settings that have been very difficult in the past. And what about outpatient recovery um, houses? What are their policies? Are they going to allow the patients to be on sublingual, injectable? These are all things to be thinking about. And of course, state regulations. We're talking about what dose, right? Well, maybe there are state regulations that are going to say what dose you can give or whether or not you can go macro um, or, you know, you have to think about those things. Provider and clinic level factors for the injectable. Is that clinic, do they have a locked refrigerator that can hold the DEA Schedule 3? Do they have the administrative support for the required record keeping? Next slide. Other factors to consider when initiating. Next slide. <clears throat> You know, we've heard home is very well accepted, but so important to think about how are you teaching that patient about observed objective withdrawal. We've heard anxiety. They can be misinterpretation of what withdrawal is. So make sure we're teaching our patients, look at their pupils. Is their belly rumbling? Make them start thinking about what are some more objective signs of withdrawal that can help them have a good response to that home induction. And of course, you know, encourage um, to them to do it on a day your clinic's open. So that way there can be some form, uh, some office support that they can call or potentially even come in if there's a problem. So still having the, the potential to have some in-office observation is certainly helpful. What's that first dose gonna be? We've heard a lot about the dose, the sublingual doses that we have available, two and four I have highlighted because that's what's in the FDA labeling. Um, we frequently are trying to cut in all that to try to figure out if we need to go lower or try and go higher. With the injectable, there's the labeling says there's a seven day lead in. Can we do it earlier? Um, people are doing it earlier, but you know sometimes, um, how early can we do it? Um, there have been really few outpatient RCTs. We've have um, Dr. D'Onofrio's wonderful JAMA with the ED showing yes we can do it. It's very low um, overall rate of uh, precipitated withdrawal. Very reassuring. That included people on fentanyl. Some people um, are also uh, are going to be testing positive for heroin. Might still have methadone, xylazine, methamphetamine. Still, also very complicated picture. And what's their previous experience? Um, are they already kind of freaked out and thinking it's not going to work? Really, really important to acknowledge what the patient's anxiety level is and what their expectations are because we need to try and shift that. Right, our whole thing is to try and exude hope and success, right? This, this is really important. Remember the placebo effect, the role of conditioning and expectations. 
So we as the healthcare provider really want to put that, um, have that positive expectation there. This is an older study I just bring up because I think it's still really interesting to think about from a scientific perspective. This was done um, over a decade ago, thinking about, we knew that buprenorphine could have antagonistic properties under certain circumstances. That was well known, right? When we rolled out waiver training, when uh, buprenorphine was approved initially, and it was thought that it was due to like level of tolerance of so physical dependence. And so this was a study that looked for what is the dose that's going to precipitate withdrawal among people with a very high level of physical dependence. And so it's a human laboratory study. People were maintained on hundred milligrams of methadone. So high level of physical dependence. They were, this is a within subject, a triple dummy study, uh, really complicated, beautiful scientifically. Um, found the dose that precipitated withdrawal, gave up to 32 milligrams um, of the combination product sublingually. That was the first phase of the study. And then the second phase, they gave that same dose, but under divided um, doses, just to see um, if you could kind of eliminate that uh, precipitated withdrawal experience. And so here is on our next slide, we'll show you 10 subjects, three were able to get to 32 milligrams and never had any withdrawal. Incredible, right? So there's something else going on here, different alleles, SNPs, things that are, I think are really interesting, um, but we don't know much about. So we could do some more science there, but seven did experience that precipitated withdrawal and at a variety of different doses, four, eight, 16. And when you split, you had less precipitated withdrawal. So I think this is where the whole idea of giving the smaller dose came from. So I just wanted to kind of remind us about this. Um, I think there's some, you know, there's, there's scientific factors that could be further explored. Let's next slide. Other things we want to consider, we heard um, from Dr. Weimer, our practice standards, you know, there's dosing guidelines, but we're supposed to individualize treatment and continue it as long as the patients are benefiting. I think people were talking about how the population's getting sicker, experiencing more medical complications. I think we need to start really inserting a framework of other complex illnesses that are affected by social determinants of health, have environmental factors, everything. Um, think about major depressive disorder and diabetes to help guide our thinking here. Are we happy with these definitions of stable and maintaining and talking about who and why to taper? Why aren't we talking more about remission? We talk about remission of you know, major depression. Uh, clinicians focus on outcomes like function, quality of life, trying to prevent the complications of untreated or under, undertreated disease. This really managed, this parallels the medical management of other complex disorders is what we're seeing with the previous talk with EMS, managing people in the field and seeing what happens with untreated disease, right? You end up with a motor vehicle accident we just saw, not just overdose. This is a study that is, um, was undertaken as part of a dissertation um, with, Dr. with Fei Tong Lee and her supervisor, Dr. Svetla Salova, that is under review, took Kentucky's CASPER data, our state prescription monitoring program, and these are all Kentucky residents, adults, that were initiating transmucosal buprenorphine, and they had no previous uh, transmucosal buprenorphine. Put them into three buckets of their first average daily dose over 30 days. So you see these three buckets of less than eight milligrams a day, or greater than eight to, to um, 16, or greater than 16. The cohort, which was just under 50,000 patients, was then followed for 365 days. And we were able to connect CASPER and our um, death certificate records. And what we find is that opioid-involved overdose deaths are much reduced if you're on a higher dose compared to that less, that less than eight milligram dose. And deaths from other causes also were lower. Um, so nice kind of dose effect and complete um, contrast to what happens with prescription opioid analgesics for pain. Next slide. If we adjust for other things like um, gender, urban, rural residency, what they've gotten in the last 30 days, like benzos, other controlled um, non-opioid substances, these results are holding steady with the higher dose having less risk of death. Next slide. Wraparound services, so important um, and can help people stay in treatment. It's really important to have a well-trained um, others 
besides the healthcare system if the person drops out or can't get in. So part of the healing community study in Kentucky, we partnered with a recovery community organization to develop a training for peer supports where they work in the field at places likely to find, um, encounter people with opiate use disorder, like a syringe support program. They, um, we train them, the training curriculum is 150 hours. We make sure they have good health literacy themselves about MOUD so that they can explain risks, benefits, the basics of the medicine. They have a competency check before they're deployed. We've trained um, about over a hundred now recovery coaches and their supervisors. And this can just be really, really helpful. They bust barriers along the way. Our next slide is going to show one of our most effective barrier busting um, programs, which is a transportation program where, you know, this was the major barrier to getting and staying in treatment with buprenorphine and methadone. And, um, you know, we've had so much transportation, the total miles in the first wave of the study has been eight times around the world. And the beauty of having the recovery coaches that are trained being the drivers is that they can share their stories of hope and learn maybe about other barriers and assist while um, you're driving. Very helpful for our rural counties. Next slide. So other things that we should be thinking about, mobile treatment I think holds much promise, especially for rural areas, the potential for injectables, including injectables within mobile vans, other pharmacy models, Australia has you know, supervised dosing within pharmacies for sublingual buprenorphine. Um, the injectable certainly decreases risk, I think, for diversion or in the eyes of people that this is their focus is everything is about diversion, like our criminal legal system. They like this idea. Um, definitely helps solve some adherence and provides that um, study level so that we don't have to worry if the pharmacy is going to have it or they can't get um, to the next clinic appointment. But it has a really complex distribution in REMS um, that actually if the patient no-shows and you've had it shipped to you from one of those specialty pharmacies, you may have to waste the medicine. You can't automatically like just give it um, to a different patient. Some patients feel more of a sense of agency over this. They get the medicine, they know they have it but some feel the opposite. Um, tapering, we wanna keep our end goal in mind. Some patients can taper slowly over time and stay in remission. There's the luxury I call it of, of some of us who have patients who are on two milligrams now where it's really hard to get down from that dose. It's notable, um, previous speakers have mentioned, Europe has lower milligram formulations, the 0 .0, 0 0.2 and the 0 0.4 milligram temgesic. The U.S. has micrograms, but they're for pain and not for OUD. Can we taper with injections by either increasing the duration, spacing out those injections, decrease the dose? Those are other, I think, opportunities. And adding on ancillary meds to help, I think, is also another opportunity. Next. This is a complicated slide. I, the point here I was just trying to make is this with our sublingual subutex, current sublocade that's here in the U.S., Two other, the weekly and monthly product available in Europe and Australia that FDA will be reviewing later this month. Just we have potential new products coming down the line that are going to offer lower doses, higher doses, and potentially be an opportunity to help patients get to and, and stay in care. Next. But this is a, a really big issue is all these regulations, so much change that's really positive, right? The letter that you shared to try and make it clear that we shouldn't be withholding doses if someone's not going to counseling. We, we the, the providers, the clinicians, the pharmacists, the direct doctors, nurse practitioners, we all have licensing boards that we have to follow. And so one of the questions we had in the Healing Communities Policy work group was whether or not with the HHS April 2021 um, allowance for the 30E was whether the licensing boards were going to allow um, their licensees to get the 30E because some, we already knew that some state regulatory boards had educational requirements and, and extra things besides the federal regulations. And so we called all 50 state um, licensing boards and um, also single state agencies to try to mimic what it would be like as a as a provider if they were you know going to go and try and get their 30e to see if they would be allowed to do it we also asked if they were going to be discussing the new HHS regulations and we searched Westlaw what we found were 15 states were not aligned so they if you're following your state's regulations you wouldn't be um really in accordance with being able to prescribe and then we found a lot of different reasons for that. And the next slide is going to show you some of the things that we heard. So medical boards, just some just said they couldn't provide us with any other information. Some told us they didn't know. Nursing boards, 
some, some referred us to private legal counsel um, and single state agencies. We sometimes heard, you know, um, one of the agency's ma major advocates is very old school. So they've decided, you know, we just basically don't know yet. So lots of different things, right? Like, but really good to hear this, right? Because it tells us of how we, how can we address this? And the next slide, I think has just has me thinking more about, you know, this, all of this policy change. And since there's so many, when you make policy change at the federal level, it travels through so many different agencies and boards and then to healthcare systems and their, you know, CMOs and then down to the providers themselves to get to the patients. And of course the pharmacies is that how do we prevent communication breakdown in such a rapidly evolving area of both science and policy? Um, and you know what are you allowed to do too? Our our um, doctoral student pointed out that HHS has a great social media platform with more than 2.5 million people following on through Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Um, and our licensing boards and pharmacies, you know, we're not trying to um, throw anyone underneath the bus. We recognize these are made up of volunteers a lot of times, and lots of times they don't have expertise. And we have to remember that a lot of the licensing boards kind of got in trouble with the prescription opioid epidemic by some of their legislatures, right, that that regulate the licensing boards for not doing enough with the prescription opiate epidemic, right? Like, why weren't you policing your doctors and your licensees then? And there's this gross misunderstanding um, about buprenorphine and, and, and methadone affect these um, these agencies, you know, I'll hear things like, how could another opioid really be the answer? Really? You know, when people are, are, are being really honest with me. Um, and how does the board, even when they, when they do have members that really get it, how do they spread the information so that they can do it and, and, and not get backlash? You know, how can we, are we allowed to have community, um, public health communication campaigns? So with that, I know I'm out of time. But um, whirlwind tour, right? Not just dose, lots of things other than dose. But I, for, from my point of view, I'm trying to go at it to think about four things, medical ethics, which are also research ethics, do not harm, beneficence, justice and autonomy, and trying just to find a positive way forward wherever we can. So I feel like I'm on a rapid diplomacy 101 class and trying to do that with everyone. Um, stay calm, don't jump to conclusions, ask questions. I'll stop there, thank you. Oh, oh no, I can't stop there. I have to do my acknowledgements and gratitude because all of this wouldn't be available um, if we didn't have FDA, NIDA, SAMHSA, core SOAR funding in our own Department of Behavioral Health, which funds a lot of our clinical services for um, medication for opiate use disorder and our great Kentucky HEAL team that's led by um, Dr. Sharon Walsh. We have over hundred faculty and staff um, and so many state and um, community agencies that have supported us. So thank you. That's great. Thanks, Dr. Lofwell, and for, for helping us pivot to what we need to think about when we're looking at buprenorphine uh, initiation and maintenance in the, in the community setting. So we're going to bring our panel up to have a, a discussion here for about the next um, 40 minutes or so. So I want to welcome to the stage Dr. Jeff Bratberg, who is a clinical professor of pharmacy practice at the University of Rhode Island. Also, Dr. Jeremy Dubin, who is Chief Medical Officer of Front Range Clinic in Colorado. Dr. Liza Hutchison, the Medical Director of MAT Services at Packard Health and an Assistant Professor of Family Medicine at the University of Michigan. And Jade Waits, who is a Peer Recovery Specialist with Boulder Care. So thank you all for joining us. We wanna pivot from the panel we had before that was talking about what we do in emergency services and initiation, initiating in the hospital environment and turn to another common place um, for initiation and that being the community setting. And so I wanna turn first, Dr. Hutchinson, I'm gonna to turn to you first. Um, illustrate for us some initiation strategies that you've seen work well in the outpatient setting. Absolutely, thanks so much, Susan. Really glad to be here and just want to say, I'm so grateful for this conversation. You know, part of my role and passion is expanding buprenorphine prescribing in the primary care workforce and the waiver elimination provided this amazing opportunity to train up lots of new folks. Um, but at the same time, the challenges of initiation have 
prevented a lot of folks from wanting to kind of walk through that door of opportunity. And so the conversation, I think the guidelines and the innovations that will stem from this conversation will really help in that effort. Um, for context, I'm working sort of mostly in the community health center and previously in a syringe service-based clinic. So my patients are very much low resourced, a uh, lot of housing instability, social chaos, lots of morbidity and mortality from OUD. And so really our initiation strategy is anything we can do to get that patient started. Um, and I'll talk through kind of things that I'm considering when I think about that. Um, you know, most of our folks at this point, you know, this is really, I guess, to boil it down, it's shared decision making really with a patient and trying to lend our medical knowledge, but really find out what, what's the patient willing to do and able to do. So things that we always talk about is, you know, at this point, almost everyone has had experience with buprenorphine. So really talking through with people what has been their experience previously. Um, you know, some people have a way that they already know they get started and they want to just do that same thing, even if it doesn't fit our protocols. So we go with that. Other people, you know, have felt like they've experienced precipitated withdrawal. So they're very nervous about that and they want to try a new way. So a lot of conversation about prior experience, thinking a lot about people's living situation, whether they have um, social support, phone access, you know, whether they can go through withdrawal symptoms if they're living in a tent outdoors, you know, may or may not be safe for them to be incapacitated by withdrawal when they're, you know, living outdoors. Um, also, as was mentioned, you know, thinking about what is like local insurance coverage for different dosing limits, um, what's their housing situation, can they be on buprenorphine? Um, those are a lot of the things that we're trying to think about all in that first visit. That being said, we are trying sort of all three types of um, initiations that have already been discussed, um, sort of what has been used in the inpatient and the ER setting. I'd say the majority we're still using more of a traditional or standard start, um, sometimes doing um, the higher dose or macro starts, that's a little bit newer for us. Um, and patients feel, because of prior experience and everything they've heard about buprenorphine, a lot of folks are very nervous about the thought of sort of a macro dose or a higher start, but, um, but we've had some good success with folks doing that. We are doing low dose initiations um, in some settings. And you know, this was referenced in the inpatient con conversation and something we struggle with a lot is, you know, can you ask a patient to continue using their illicit opioid? for a week while they start their low dose initiation. So if we have someone do this, you know, it's really oftentimes someone who, first of all, isn't quite ready to stop using anyways. Um, so this is sort of a nice on-ramp for them to try buprenorphine out, but maybe they're not fully on board to stop. So that can be one, one good situation. And then if they are gonna continue using for that week, you know, we do a lot of really careful counseling about safer use strategies if they're gonna continue doing that. But again, if that sort of is the only way they're gonna get started, um, from a harm reduction standpoint, we we use that. And then lastly, we just do a lot of counseling with folks, you know, what's their withdrawal symptom cascade? How do they call us? What's, you know, precipitated withdrawal versus your existing anxiety? What do you do if you think you've precipitated? How do you contact us? And we really, you know, use our multidisciplinary team and following up with folks by phone during this process and, and particularly helpful as our peer support folks. So um, I will leave it at that and pass to the next person. Uh, thanks, Dr. Hutchison. Um, really, I, I'm struck by the prior experience and the importance of, of having that conversation. Dr. Dubin, what would you kind of confirm or contrast with your experience and in initiation in outpatient setting with what Dr. Hutchinson shared? Great. Th thanks, Susan, for having me. And, and I, I couldn't uh, second more what Dr. Hutchinson was saying. Give a little context uh, what we do in, in Colorado, we have a large network of outpatient clinics that our motto is low barrier, high access, and we treat mostly underserved folks. So we're embedded in all sorts of different flavors of environments from uh, homeless shelters to uh, syringe access centers, to hospitals, to brick and mortar clinics, to mobile units that go to the frontier and rural sites. So we, we get to see a lot of different folks out there in, in ways that we can get uh, folks induced quickly. And I would really second almost everything Dr. Hutchinson said uh, you know, we go from regular induction very quickly now to low dose initiation uh, with fentanyl. That's that's happened quicker. We are a, a large harm reduction site. So so the idea that um, access is more important than continuity for us so we, we, to get you in is really important. That's always been what we've thought, but it's become more important than ever. Um, I'm going to throw out something uh, that has that I don't think has been said yet, but I'm going to I think it's been spoken to, but I, I couldn't second more what everyone is saying. But the idea of extended release buprenorphine, so the sublocades out there, 
Um, we are experimenting with lower doses with folks. So as, as we're going to talk more about that at the end of this, um, you know, different recommendations uh, that have been thrown out there. We have been doing that because what we've been noticing is that, as, as everyone has said, this low dose initi initiation, although is a, is, is a great harm reduction um, uh, process or, or a sign of progress, we all hold our breath. And I, I, we all hold our breath when we, we say to our folks, hey, you know, we can't condone this, but be careful this week. We'll see you tomorrow. We'll see you in two days. We'll see you next week. Here's some bup in your back pocket. Please start to take this, even if you're using out there. And we all hold our breath when that happens. And we have some we have some preliminary data on some using some lower doses of some extended release. So in other words, 100 milligrams is what they're using right now, 50 is even less than that. We we need some more research on that. In other words, get a depot on there, a day three, maybe day two, even the idea that we have to wait seven days. That that has been an obstacle for a lot of folks because with fentanyl, um, the, the getting the depot in there is always going to be helpful. So we can challenge the the um the the behavioral, the habituation with films and, and things like that. Um I would also set, piggyback what Dr. Hutchinson was saying about alternative induction sites, if that makes sense. So what I mean by that is we have kind of our standard emergency room. And like we said earlier, that there's different receptivity to what happens when you go to different ERs, not knocking our, our ER colleagues, just it is what it is. Uh, stigma, philosophy, training, that kind of thing. And then you have folks that are in the in the brick and mortar clinics that are doing, we're doing either low dose initiation or the regular in inductions we're doing. Uh, so, something kind of in the middle, which we all I think can can, can can collaborate that or agree happens already. So some of these more social detoxes is 3.2s out there where someone goes in there, they know they need medicine, they're not criteria, they're not meeting criteria for an emergency room. So they either contract with a provider or they send them to an urgent care to hopefully get some Phenergan or some buprenorphin if you're lucky. And then they go back to the detox or quasi detox so that it gets administered by kind of a non-medical person. There's a lot of different in-betweens and that's where a lot, there's a lot of gaps. So the idea of we, we all walked away from in-house inductions uh, at the beginning, which I think many of us that are out there in the trenches know we do about 99%. We don't, we, we send people home to do inductions. That's changing. We're bringing people in now and, and letting them sit in a room for five, six, seven hours. It's not an official detox, but it's us getting the medications, us actually initiating induction. And in that time, hooking up all these wraparound services as if, if they're feeling okay with case management, counseling, things along those lines. We also have, an, just to add to that, um, what we call RAM Swiss World Ambulatory Medically Supervised Withdrawal, not the best there. But the idea is when someone induces, we actually have a medical assistant calling them that evening uh, with their information on their, their protocol and their confirmation of their appointment, usually the next day or the day after. And then uh, some recommendations for ER triage if they need to. So what's been spoken here before and and, and what Dr. Lofa uh, was saying earlier was how important that is, that, that, that initial 24, 48, 72 hours. Uh, and then some of our colleagues earlier from the ER uh, we're here. We're not going anywhere. We're going to keep trying at this. Um, so I, I think I think that would maybe piggyback on what Dr. Hutchinson was saying. And I, mean, I have some more, but I, I'll, I'll let some other folks go. Yeah, yeah, really helpful. I'm particularly thinking about the dosing, but then the the wraparound services. So, um, Dr. Bretberg, tell us about how you know. Are there initiation? of buprenorphine in a pharmacy-based setting? Is there a role for pharmacy to play here? Well, I absolutely think so. We have 60,000 uh, pharmacies that uh, on, all in different states with different state laws. In Rhode Island, we successfully inducted over 100 folks and had a, a massive difference in a randomized controlled trial where they went from induction in the pharmacy to be randomized to usual care or to continued pharmacy care and 89% at 30 days stayed in the pharmacy. We can't do the study again. It's essentially unethical to not offer induction buprenorphine in the pharmacy. I think we'd all agree there. All the pharmacists were trained. This is our New England Journal of Medicine uh, paper that we um, that we published with Dr. Joseph Green and, and Rich and our, and our folks. And we have a great supplement that explains our, our collaborative practice agreement. So this was enabled because of the DEA telehealth regulations, which are on pause, I think many of us would agree should be permanently on pause, um, to allow what we call you know, physician delegated induction. Uh, now with the waiver gone, because pharmacists were never part of the waiver, and so 
people live within five miles of the pharmacy. We talk about mobile clinics. I think that's fantastic. You know where they go? To the pharmacy parking lot. When we need people to be able to go into the pharmacy, be recruited from outreach, um, a third of our participants were actually recruited from word of mouth, which meant that the pharmacy was the experience that they had. I totally agree. I've researched pharmacists and community pharmacies. There are limitations to stocking. There are limitations in stigma and discrimination, but nothing really any different than any other healthcare provider. So I just want to make sure we're not making that distinction. So we need to have pharmacies. We need all these dosage forms. We need withdrawal treatment. Talk about Phenergan. Um, you know, we we need we can do that right now uh, without buprenorphine. And we need everyone to be an advocate to say, let's offer this. And I think it'll become more popular if we pass federal law that allows methadone to be dispensed, uh, prescribed by primary care and dispensed from pharmacies. Now we can offer complete medications for opioid use disorder treatment in the pharmacy where there's already methadone, where most pharmacists can administer naltrexone, where pharmacists can uh, stop buprenorphine, but now uh, initiate therapy for people in our study, 80% of people were either in no or mild withdrawal. And so it's very important. 100% of our participants were unobserved induction, safe, effective, uh, and a larger percentage of people were stabilized and came back um, than even some of the most effective ED settings. So this is a setting that needs to be used. It doesn't need to be studied anymore. And we'll have more data coming out on uh, the outcomes at three months. So I think more of a continuum, right, where where you have individuals who may be able to initiate in the pharmacy versus those who would be better in the setting where they're kind of quasi supervised. Is how, That's the label I'm going to give what you described, Dr. Jubin, <laughs> um, you know, or, or have availability of those services versus those who, you know, might even be in the prior panel and, and in hospital and, and well, EMS. Well, they're the connector. I mean, that our, mm -hmm. our program is called Pharmacy Bridge. We're in Rhode Island. We've got lots of, or the Ocean State, we have lots of bridges. But everything we talk about is bridge to care. We can ask our colleagues what happens when a provider of 250 patients on buprenorphine retires or yeah. dies. Where do those patients go? Pharmacies need to be there to bridge therapy. They need to be there to initiate therapy. They need to maintain therapy from ED programs, from mobile pharmacies, from inpatient discharges. And I'll emphasize what my colleagues have said. We have a huge problem with the REMS that uh, unnecessarily excludes community pharmacies and community pharmacists from administering that, which would be a huge advantage for upcoming forms that can be used for induction and the current form, uh, FDA approved forms that are used for maintenance. Yep. Okay. So when we're going to come to that, right, I want Jade to unmute because we need to hear her voice and thought. And then I'll note, I'm going to come to everyone to say uh, what other formulations would be helpful. So be ready with that rapid fire response of what other formulations we need. But Jade, you work with individuals who are um, using buprenorphine in a different way. Tell us about that and the uh, you know, you know, what are, what's essentially in, in the work that you do? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. This has been really informative and exhilarating. Um, we do, uh, so I work for a telehealth recovery service, um, and we see a variety of patients in diverse um, forms of recovery, diverse uh, times in their lives. Um, we're seeing folks that are houseless, we're f seeing folks that are in long-term remission that may just want uh, maintenance or, um, you know, to look into like tapering off of buprenorphine. We're seeing folks that maybe are in active crisis that have come to us after immediate overdose um, or, you know, the overdose of a loved one um, and just, you know, initially considering um, induction. And so we're definitely getting a variety of patients and patient interests in terms of how they want their care model to look. And uh, one thing that's super important to all of us um, at Boulder is making sure that the patient autonomy is the priority and that we center the care around that. Um, you know, I think the biggest difference, especially from what I've heard a lot of today, um, is that ERs, urgent cares, even EMS, even an EMS vehicle are all equipped with different supports that someone coming to us, in, you know, through an outpatient, um, in an outpatient program does not have access to or may not have access to. So, you know, even in an EMS uh, vehicle, you're seeing fluids, you're seeing other stabilization medications. You have people interactively there to support a crisis. There's Narcan in the vehicle. You know, there's so many other um, opportunities for support. And so 
oftentimes um, in our work, we're, we're seeing folks that maybe don't even have access to clean drinking water to take their medication or a ride to the pharmacy to pick up what is prescribed to them at the end of a visit um, if they're prescribed medication. So uh, we definitely try to identify different needs um, and as well as goals of a patient. Um, I think that, you know, with outpatient um, and telehealth, there is, you know, there's, there are still stigmas exi that exist that kind of affect the providers and prescribers. Um, you know, obviously nobody wants to feel that they're either over prescribing a higher dose um, when it's not needed. And I think there's a little bit of a difficulty in being able to say, what is right for a patient through a screen because you know in person i think people are able to triage situations differently even as a peer um, with lived recovery experiences you know we're we're able to kind of pick up on body language and tone of voice and if we see someone coming with five kids then we kind of know more of those barriers but i think um, through telehealth it can be more challenging and so really like focusing on the patient in the initial interaction and engagement um, and making sure that we're asking the questions. What are your goals? What are the barriers that brought you here? You know, some folks are kicked out of an out or out of an inpatient facility, or they leave an ER after being there for five hours um, with their children, and they say, "Well, I return to use, and now I'm going to focus on trying to navigate this app and get into care here because I can't do it any other way." And so I think that um, you know, maintaining that focus on the autonomy of the folks involved is huge, and and that kind of transcends into, um, you know, what type of dose or what type of induction method might be right for someone. Um, we are doing a lot of research um, with a uh, quick start method, which, you know, is kind of, um, you know, the word I feel is spreading um, to a lot of other uh, folks in recovery services that are promoting um, different forms of induction. So um, basically inducing with naloxone or Narcan, um, inducing withdrawal, and then following up with buprenorphine and, you know, a variety of doses in a safe manner um, to make sure that some folks that are having a hard time with that induction um, are kind of able to have a shorter time span of their withdrawal effects, allegedly, you know, that what we could hope for, it's different for everybody. Um, but, you know, that that has offered a lot of hope and another option to folks that are houseless, uh, maybe only have a motel for a few days to go through the more severe withdrawal effects that they might be experiencing. Um, and so we're kind of uh, working through a lot of that research right now and just finding what works for people and what might not um, and what other supports might be needed to be added to um, the care that we can provide. Um, and yeah, I, we're also working with, you know, folks that might be having childcare limitations, recently released from incarceration, things like that. So, yeah. So, um, reminding us that there's, there are stops and starts as well, right? And, and thinking through those, those services. Well, um, we know that FDA asked for this meeting. So they have a very, very, you know, kind of this question, what, what is it? that product developers should be thinking about? What are the needs um, in this space? So what, what might you want to see in terms of different dosage forms, um, change to the rim, but like, what else would you like to see? I'm gonna say whoever unmutes first, ah, Dr. Dubin wins, um, and then Dr. Hutchison, and so start unmuting if you wanna jump in. Dr. Dubin, what do we need on the dosage, on, what do we need in alternative? Yeah, I think you can you can start to see a trend going on here. Uh, I think let's start with sublingual dosages. I think that we need the lower dosages, the 0.5s, uh, the films, the one milligrams, even the 0.25s. We, we do this a lot. Uh, I think that that would be very, very useful. Going into the transdermal second, what our colleagues were saying, having indication for transdermal for opioid use disorder would be great, especially as, as the folks that are using or using some of these medicines, they can learn more about how the, the speed of delivery and things like that, because you got to know that all these addiction providers don't have a lot of experience with the transdermals on the outpatient. So we need a little bit of research there, but that's really, that would be really great to be able to use those, have an indication and make it cost effective, especially for our underserved folks. And I, I, I mean, I can't speak enough about uh, the transdermal, what a colleague said earlier in, in the hospital setting, but the idea that you can take it on and off. I mean, this is this is a really good medicine or, or, or a, a route there. And then the, and then the last one I would say is, is the um, the extended release buprenorphine piece. Um, 
I, I think that it's worth us doing a little research into giving that those doses a little earlier than that seven day window, as well as potentially even a lower dose to just get the depot in there and what that barrier can do. I know that the data is kind of is, is, is based on, on from the pharmaceutical company, but it would be, we're doing this in practice and, I, and colleagues here have said they're already doing this anyway. And we're doing this in the PEDS population. So just to throw a big umbrella over the whole thing on those formulations, PEDS indications. We are doing this with 12, 13 year olds and younger. We are already doing this. We're doing, and we'd much rather be giving them depots than to have them having films and doing harm reduction with an adolescent. So um, yes, that, that those are those are my preliminary ones. So only lower dose sublingual, break the boxes of the patches, extended release depot and pediatric indications. Okay, <laughs> those are all great, great list and echoes a bit of what we heard earlier. Dr. Hutchinson, what do you want to add? Yeah, mostly strongly second everything Dr. Dubin said, but I would also just add different, you know, starter packs for different types of starts, you know, starter pack for a high dose start, a starter pack for, especially for the low dose. Um, okay. it's, just, it's tricky for folks. So, um, starter packs would be huge, different flavors, I think was mentioned before, but flavor is often, I've definitely seen folks discontinue just because they get nauseous whenever they, they taste the flavor. Um, films that could dissolve more quickly. Um, that's another barrier. And then I think if I were to go to huge dream world, um, you know, co-formulation with PrEP or co-formulation with various forms of contraception, um, I think would be amazing. You know, there's a lot of unintended pregnancy, um, in our population. So, um, lofty goals would, would also be though, those co-formulations. Mm -hmm. Co-formulation or even just co-packaging, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, all, all in one there. Yep. Go ahead, Dr. Bretberg. And I would, I would extend that to say that we have data that pharmacists are unlikely to, again, we're not treating 90% of the population that wants OUD treatment. And so, and even though we've removed the waiver, prescribers aren't stepping up um, and we, that's not unexpected. So if we have pharmacists who are prescribing, or if we do actually do see that pickup, pharmacies are not going to stock something that they don't sell. And so it's important that not only I agree with all the other dosing forms that we really need um, flexibility in, in the, the package sizes, right? So maybe not necessarily a, a starter pack. And I think other folks mentioned this, but something that's, that's, again, not set, but just allow you to say, we're going to buy seven days worth, or we're going to, you know, things that come in, um, you know, in film packages or things like that, because otherwise you take one film out, you take one patch out that was mentioned, we do that. I think the other thing is that, that we, instead of asking someone to use a extraordinarily unsafe, unpredictable supply as they ramp up on their buprenorphine, why not approve, you know, uh, controlled release morphine or have morphine patches, these things that already exist. Fentanyl, you know, we need safe supply as well. We need those kinds of approvals so that we can uh, prescribers or who or prescribing clinicians can use multiple forms of buprenorphine um, to assure patient safety. Everything we're hearing today is all about what the patient wants. Let's give them what they want. Really helpful. Um, and and thinking about uh, you know other ways to to address. Dr. Lawful, did you want to add anything to the formulations that might be needed? I just, I think it's so hard. I mean, I think that I appreciate that FDA has an incredible number of regulations that it has to follow that are largely based on safety and efficacy. Like it's incredibly complicated for them. Um, at the same time, like the opiate epidemic has become so right. much more severe, right? So like 10 years ago, it would be hard, very hard for me to have found, you know, most of the people were just, you know, snorting or insufflating, right? Um, and now it's really hard to find someone that's not injecting. And 10 years ago, our hospital was not full of people with bacteremia, seeding, you know, valves, bones, mycotic aneurysms due to untreated or inadequately treated opiate use disorder that was very severe and all injection related. So like Dr. D'Onofrio or someone in the last session just talked about like, end stage addiction. Like there is a lot of end stage kind of addiction that we're seeing now. There's also a population that isn't, that we see that's been in treatment, long-term remission, they need to get off, right? Like they want to be off. They, they would like to try to go down gently and be comfortable and not. So like we need the lower doses for them, but like if there was a way, you know, like the, so when they're considering REMS and all of this, right? Like there's how do we make it just to 
and respect autonomy, provide the most benefit and do no harm, right? The Mm -hmm. medical ethic of do no harm is also FDA's, I think, with their principle of safety. But there's all these other things. And so how I'm just trying to think about creatively and how hard this all is. Pharmacies are ubiquitous. The jails, the criminal justice connection is complicating everything. Jails are not excited about giving anything that is sublingual. They are they are very interested in something that's quick and fast because even if you do telemedicine, they don't have uh, they don't have jail staff to bring the person into the telemedicine room. They've had a really hard time having like normal standard of care for like other medical illnesses. Yeah. So yeah. you know we're this is complicated. Yeah. So let's come back. I want to come back to the incarcerated in a bit, but you mentioned something we should talk about, and that's uh, tapering or discontinuation. And we know that that's not recommended or the goal according to, you know, kind of clinical guidelines. But we also know that some patients might want to discontinue buprenorphine treatment. So how how do you help patients manage that process if they they want to to decrease? Dr. Dubin, you want to jump on that? Providers collaborate about is um, it's not philosophically whether you should be on this medicine or not. It's the idea of if you want to taper off buprenorphine, if there's not a medical reason to do it, the question comes up is, okay, what is your abstinence-based strategy? And so let's work that out and let's really let that be sound. And, you know, often we find that it might, we might not get there. We might end up on two milligrams and that's okay too. So it's an opportunity for education, opportunity for goal setting. It's not in a manipulative way to say to somebody, hey, you shouldn't be on buprenorphine. It's more of a time, an opportunity to reinforce to somebody what this tool is often doing for them. I would challenge that a lot of the time folks will walk out of a good educational setting like that and say, well, you know, things are going pretty good. My first 15 years were pretty awful. And, and these last five years have been pretty good. What, what am I pushing this for? The folks that really want to taper off, the idea is, is, is let's get that program in place. Is it naltrexone? Is it, is it Lexapro? Is it a good counselor? Is it divorce? Is it marital counseling? Is it quitting your job? Is it treating the co-occurring issue? You know, and, and, and is there enough of a threshold that you can meet that, that we can taper off this slowly? And, and with the understanding that you might have some biochemical vulnerability to this kind of like diabetes and and maybe you do end up staying on two milligrams and that's okay too. So if anything, when the tapering conversations come up, we always look at those as great opportunities to discuss the big the big picture. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, so I'm not really getting into, I mean, I could get into dosing and stuff like that with y'all, but 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 I think that's the the one of the biggest things we like to say is, is let, let's set this up successfully so that when we do say, okay, let's go down by two milligrams, you know, if you're at 16 or something, and that's mm-hmm. not a, well for most people. Um, but we're really clear about that. Before we do that, let's set the stage. Let's really set the table well so they feel confident about that taper process. Yeah, and leveling out, leveling out whenever, even if you level out at eight milligrams for a year and a half, and you're still in a trajectory, but Mm -hmm. goals, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dr. Hutchinson. Oh yeah, I would just add, you know, similar conversations we have with patients, but I think, you know, this really points to, I think, something we haven't dis- discussed a lot, which is stigma against buprenorphine. And I think I certainly experienced a lot of folks coming to me wanting to taper because someone in NA told them they shouldn't be on it or because their housing, their recovery housing doesn't allow it or because they think they're going to be incarcerated and they're not going to be on it. So I think, you know, as we work to eliminate some of the social stigma, hopefully, against feds for OUD, I, I think some of those tapering conversations will will taper off. <laughs> Um, you know, I think they'll, it'll always be relevant and it will always be important for some folks to be able to do that. But um, I do think a lot of it is driven by community stigma. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I would just say, of, oh, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say normalizing view is, is the thing. We, we, we've got a generation to overcome prescribers' reluctance to prescribe opioids. And as long as BUP is an opioid, which we can't change, and as long as it's a scheduled medicine, which DEA is in charge of, we need to take efforts to say we're not getting rid of long-term chronic pain, but implement guidelines like the VA just did, which says their go-to chronic opioid is buprenorphine so that pharmacists see it, so that prescribers, prescribing clinicians see it. And so it becomes a normal thing to stock. And guess what other forms of other dosage forms help? It helps all of those folks too. So there's two groups of people to think about. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So not just would, in the opioid use disorder. Yep, go ahead, Jade. I would also mention from the patient standpoint in regards to tapering that, um, you know, along with the stigmas um, in general that can exist that kind of prevent folks from wanting to stay on maybe preemptively before they're ready to taper, there also exists, um, you know, a reluctance to taper because oftentimes there's been such a barrier in getting medication in the first place, whether that's because, you know, access issues or because of stigma that exists um, or just, you know, recent relapse. Um, And so when you finally retrieve medication and you find a provider that feels inclusive and that is providing what you need, sometimes feeling like, okay, well, am I ready to taper? I want to have this conversation, but what happens if it's preemptive and now I'm left without meds or now I'm, you know, preemptively tapering and then they don't want to prescribe the dosage that was initially working for me in the first place. And so sometimes we're seeing folks that are tapering and then having the conversations after the fact and saying, oh, well, I've actually been taking, you know, a quarter of a strip now, but I didn't want to say anything because I was scared that I wasn't ready to say much. And obviously those conversations are more helpful to providers when they are had because it allows folks to know what's working and what's not um, and what's needed. So I think remaining um, open as a provider in any position um, is helpful for patients and knowing like encouraging the conversation that you know whatever medication or dosage works in a safe manner for that patient can still be reconsidered even if tapering is um, something that's happening mm-hmm. okay so really helpful in, in using that as a conversation right to continue the conversation about why why tapering and 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 um, and then opportunities to do so if if they so choose, um, but keeping that that conversation open, I'm I'm struck and and it's come up a bit in the the telemedicine angle. But w- what are the other strategies for those who are in in rural settings? Is there some? What do we do do differently when it's it's not three buses to get somewhere? It's right. It's a long car ride without a car available. Pharmacy. That's my answer. <laughs> Definitely an option. Yep. Go ahead, Dr. Dubin. We, we see this in a lot in Colorado. We serve a lot of the rural and frontier areas. And and, and to second what, what, uh, what uh, my colleague, Dr. Brackberg, is saying, the importance of collaboration with community facilities. So the ER and pharmacy, as well as just community health, is, is, is really, really vital uh, when it comes to these places. Because um, not not to challenge what my colleagues are saying, but but the idea that you don't know which pharmacy you're getting into and you don't know which ER you're going to. And so you go into these rural communities and you kind of make that assumption. And uh, and and often that can make someone that never want to use bup again and never look at that as an option because they've just been burned by that. Uh, so so that's really important. I'd second it just from the provider standpoint, the treatment place, uh, there are mobile units have been very success, have been successful in um, this is a state funded grant we have. We have for mobile units and we cruise around and we to a lot of the different rural areas and we partner with different community facilities. So this could be a counseling center, this could be a hardware store. I mean, so the idea that we would be in their parking lot and uh, and and find kindred spirits in the community to, 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 you kind of have to secure your pharmacy and you have to kind of secure your, your either urgent care slash ER or higher levels of care. And just speaking to something that, that Jade was saying earlier, speaking to the idea of this importance of continuum of care uh, with, with this. And so when you're talking about telemedicine, there's two flavors of that, I guess, right? There's the phone consult, which is which is allowed. Uh, and then there's the virtual assessment where you could have someone in there maybe getting vitals for you and things along those lines, maybe even a urine drug screen, and, and, and then seeing that person virtually. And then there's the regular brick and mortar actually putting your hands on somebody. And so not to challenge any of my colleagues that are doing purely telemedicine, but there is a challenge there. So in your rural centers where you have, you know, our, our, we have our patient in, in, in a rural situation that needs to kind of climb that ladder. Uh, we did a phone console, you know, we're going to do a virtual console with you. All right, let's go back to phone. You know what? Things have gotten a little severe for you. We'd like to be able to, to touch you. Uh, and so having the access to a, uh, actual a human being, you know, that's going to be important versus going to a facility that might not really have the education or the experience or the seasoning with this. So, you know, you, things can go south very quickly. If you do a vote phone virtual into a, into a, into a um, rural area and then say, well, if things go south for you, just go to the ER. 
um, that could that could go south very quickly. So so having that and that kind of speaks back to this whole idea of a community induction site where people can kind of count on the at the capacity of that site. So whether it's the ER, primary care, even an addiction clinic, orthopedist, pharmacy, mm-hmm. from the public, that you know that these folks, eighty nine percent, don't need to be in an emergency room, and they can pull this off. In, in, in a place, but that you know what to expect in, in something like that. And I've been reading more about that. I know things are headed that way. Yeah, yeah. So more on that continuum and the 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 providing what you can virtually, and then where it might be needed. Being able to climb the ladder, you know, yeah. being able to bring them up to a higher level of care if you need to, and that's and that's collaborating with colleagues that might do something different than you. That might be a detox or, you know, but it's finding the, it's finding those kindred spirits because that stigma where we're all speaking to it, that stigma is so powerful that this is, this is the major obstacle to to do all this. Cause if we didn't have this, this would be like, this would be like insulin. And we would say, yeah, you know, all our goal is no heart attack and stroke and we'll go down your insulin as long as that's not, I mean, it's, it's, we would just, it'd be a whole other conversation. Right. But that's a kind of, I think Dr. Lafwell mentioned this a bit in, in her slides, right? Are we, do we have we um you didn't say it quite this way dr lawful but have we medicalized it enough to understand that they're you know much like treating major depressive disorder or something else you know that we're in remission and it's a lifelong illness and so you may be on a maintenance medication for for the duration yeah and samsa does a great job doing i mean we're we're continuously educating and just to kind of regroup really fast people were saying that uh, buprenorphine is a very, very safe drug. I agree it's a very safe drug, but we do have a couple decades of some of experienced buprenorphine users that have been told differently. So, so the education is important. Although we all on this call can say, we know it's safe and hey guys, don't worry, I'm gonna give you some medicine now. And I told you a few years ago, this would precipitate withdrawal for you and you'd be like throwing up in the bathroom. But now I'm telling you that's not true. So we have we have some work to do also with that education piece with the public. I'm just saying that we all know it's safe, but I'm just throwing that out. That's been our experience. I think it's I think it's like a thing though, it's like like Stevens Johnson syndrome, right? Very rare event, but you focus on it. You teach everyone about it, right? When it's associated <laughs> right. with the medication. And that's what we've done with buprenorphine. But what we haven't done with buprenorphine is we haven't made the framework similar to other chronic, often chronic relapsing remitting illnesses, right? That have a variety of different severities, a lot of different components in the behavioral, the biopsychosocial that influence it. We, we've missed that. We have not applied that kind of framework to it. And I, I think that we have to do that because we have a mortality reducing medication by more than 50%. We have an ongoing opioid epidemic and we have people that frankly can't access it and are, have completely misinformation about it from the patients themselves to all the different agencies that impact whether how the patients actually get it. Mm-hmm. Which is a piece that we have to, you know, as we think about extending the services and then, then understanding um, and making better use of the product. And, and I'm struck, Dr. Dubin, you know, it's, it's also science where, right. We learn a lot <laughs> and adapt our thinking, uh, you know, part of the, the scientific test. So, uh, we, we thought it did that, and now we have a better understanding and experience in it. We are quickly approaching our time, and so I'm going to take the privilege of the moderator and say, uh, Dr. Hutchinson and Jay, do you each get 30 more seconds? And then we're going to close out this panel, because then we're going to talk about uh, special populations, which Dr. Lawful, I know they're going to talk about incarcerated uh, populations on the next one. But Dr. Hutchinson, 30 seconds, then Jade, 30 seconds. Fire. Great. I think the last thing I was going to add with rural, um, I, I think just, you know, increasing the primary care workforce is, is really key um, and getting everyone to prescribe. And I think that would really help with what Dr. Lawfall is saying of sort of making this a chronic disease, just like any other, you get it treated in the exact same place in the exact same way. Um, and then really glad they're going to talk about incarcerated populations, because I think that is a huge point of this conversation. Um, so thank you. Right. Excellent. All right, Jade, your 30 seconds. I was just going to add um, in terms of having like safe induction sites, I think that a good place to start along with what Jeff was saying about pharmacies is huge because folks are already going to those spaces. And I think even more innovative would be um, needle exchanges where folks are already going to find harm reduction supplies, um, naloxone distribution distribution spaces, things like that, um, where there are, you know, community efforts already happening and they feel like safe spaces to folks. 
Excellent. So great point to close out on. Thank you all for bringing us to think about the community setting and how we initiate and maintain buprenorphine use. So I've got our list of things we need, including starter packs and uh, the ability to break boxes in an extended release form and uh, co-formulation and a whole bunch of other things. Thank you all so much. Um, with that, I'm going to walk out of this virtual meeting room and I'm going to walk into the next virtual meeting room and we're going to talk about special populations. Thank you. Take care. I'm going to jump to the next session. All right, I'm in the last session of the day meeting room where we're going to talk about initiation and maintenance care in special populations. If you've been with us, we talked about inpatient, we talked about community, and now we're going to turn to a panel discussion to talk about special populations. Uh, let me do some introductions. First, Dr. Andrea Bonney is Chief of the Division of Adolescent Medicine at Nationwide Children's Hospital and is a Professor of Clinical Pediatrics at The Ohio State University School of Medicine. Dr. Caitlin Martin is the Director of OBGYN Addiction Services at Virginia Commonwealth University. Dr. Amasika Niacho is uh, Assistant Professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. And Chad Sabora is a Senior Advisor for Faces and Voices of Reco Recovery. So we're to the four of you to talk about now the, um, what we've called special populations, unique populations. Um, let's talk about adolescence. It's come up uh, at least seven times. I was keeping track um, on my, my tally. Dr. Bonnie, how do you manage buprenorphine initiation among adolescents, particularly when you're thinking about dosage and choice of formulation? Yes. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for letting me be here. And I have thoroughly enjoyed the conversation this afternoon and uh, a lot of the comments regarding um, adolescent and the need for more work in that area. And I will just add that, you know, NASHI, it looks like less than 4% of adolescents with an opioid use disorder will get any type of opioid substitution therapy or medication therapy. And for younger adolescents or underrepresented minorities, it's like even less than 1%. So happy to be here. Um, I will say that our technique is very similar to what's been talked about already this afternoon. We have, uh, because of our population, we have very limited support of programs that will take care of our patients. So our ER does not do induction. Um, we have limited ability to do supervised induction. So we've been doing this for about 15 years now, and we've been doing home induction the entire time. Um, we do pretty much standard dosing where we tell people to wait till they're feeling, experiencing withdrawal. Um, as was, was mentioned in the last section, we do a lot of talking with our patients, kind of meeting them where they're at. Uh, we discuss dosing and what they're comfortable. Most of them have actually tried buprenorphine. Most of them have bought it to try to treat, treat themselves. Many know what the experience of um, opioid withdrawal. I think we um, we don't give adolescents, we, um, we don't give adolescents the credit for how much they actually do know. Um, and so I think we've induced over 500 adolescents since the start of our program. And I can tell you we've had no safety issues. It has been very safe, very well tolerated. Initially, we were getting to um, doses of about 16 milligrams a day for maintenance. With the onset of fentanyl now, we're really going up to 24 a lot more often and we're needing to prescribe um, additional meds, Zofran, Clonidine, et cetera, to support them. Um, two issues that I wanted to bring up though within um, um, providing this to adolescents and getting them started is, one, the issue of consent. Um, many states require consent. My hospital actually requires that I have the family sign an opioid consent, which that, that they know that this is an opioid and that this is potentially addictive, which I find really counterproductive when I have a child who already has opiate use disorder, and I'm trying to prescribe her safer medication, and I have to tell the family to sign this paper. It really does nothing to prevent stigma, and it certainly doesn't make this feel like a safer option. We get through it, but, um, and then the other issue is around who is going to manage the medicine or hold the medicine initially, um, and it really is a case-by-case -case scenario. We have some instances where 
maybe in the younger adolescent, the parents really are going to be holding it and they're going to be administrating it. But then I have um, patients who their family is many family members with substance use disorder, lack of family support. I had one individual who he told his family he'd been given this med and they drove him to his dealer where they beat him up, stole his Suboxone and left him without any. And so it is really case by case who manages it. And we need to have long conversation around how is that going to work for you and who's going to oversee it, um, um, et cetera. And then we have 24 seven call um, for patients to call with any concerns. I will tell you, our, my, my colleagues were worried. These patients do not call very often. Um, everybody thinks they will, but but they really do not. It's rare that they would call the on-call doctor. Mm -hmm. So that uh, really uh, instructive for us as we think about, you know, yeah, you really have most in the home setting because we don't have the availability in, 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 in patient and yet it has worked, um, but with these these unique things, I'm I'm struck to the um, the the opioid piece. Uh, talk about creating mixed messages and yes. trying to understand uh, what what you're 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 navigating in that space. Um, so that's that's adolescent side. Let's turn to a second special population. We're going to run through our special populations and then come back and, and, and think through things. So I'm going to turn to Dr. Martin and um, let's talk about initiation and maintenance strategies for pregnant individuals and the postpartum period. Um, what, what needs to happen in there with any dosage adjustments, um, when to initiate, I, I, I would imagine you get a lot of safety questions. Talk to us about the, the pregnant individual and, and, and postpartum dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yes, and thank you for having me and also for the emphasis on both pregnancy and the postpartum period, which I define and most of us also define as a year after delivery or a year after the end of a pregnancy, even if it was a miscarriage, abortion, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of things I could cover um, just to kind of piggyback on what was our just talked about for the adolescents. For pregnant individuals, you know, we kind of we start them on buprenorphine, which is a safe medication in pregnancy. And we have lots of data to show that. And that includes both the combination product, buprenorphine naloxone, as well as the mono product buprenorphine. There was a meta-analysis or a systematic review, I'm sorry, that was published last year, the year before, looking at the combination product and essentially pooling a lot of observational data together, showing that it is safe in pregnancy. And we actually recommend that now as the standard of care. We are working on, um, people I know are working on updating the SAMHSA guidelines um, regarding the combination product. And so the reason why people generally used to think that we could only give the mono product or plain buprenorphine, in other words, during pregnancy is solely just because the first randomized control trial of methadone versus buprenorphine for the treatment of opioid use disorder in pregnancy was done using the mono product. And like everything else in obstetrics, we do one randomized control trial and then we can't do it again <laughs> because of all the ethical things that revolve around clinical trials in pregnant people. And so we keep doing the same thing over and over again. So that is the first thing I will bring up. And it's kind of the newer thing I hear a lot. People ask me questions about is the combination product and that it is safe. That is the only thing that we prescribed unless someone has a documented allergy to naloxone for all of our pregnant individuals in our clinic here at VCU, and we continue them on that during the postpartum period. How do we start buprenorphine for pregnant individuals? It's the same as anyone else, um, but because this is a special population, highly vulnerable population, and also a quote, window of opportunity where a lot of people, this might be the time during their life course where they may be more um, able to initiate treatment and access treatment because there are increased services for pregnant individuals. We offer it inpatient, outpatient and home inductions along with the program that I manage and the team that we have here at VCU. So for example, I collaborate with my OB individual, my OB colleagues and the residents here at our hospital. And what we do is any pregnant individual who comes in to the labor and delivery triage, just as they would go in to see if they're in labor, for example, and they say what well, they want to start buprenorphine for opioid use disorder, they're given that option to stay in the hospital and do that. Um, and we make sure that the residents and my OB colleagues are all trained in how to do that. We have order sets for that. And it's 
it's not that hard. So people are willing to do that and collaborate. Um, obviously, we do the normal outpatient inductions like any other opioid use disorder or substance use disorder treatment clinic, and as well as home inductions. There has been published literature on home inductions during the COVID-19 pandemic among pregnant people showing that it's feasible and safe. And I, we've recently looked at data from our own program looking at inpatient versus outpatient buprenorphine initiations in our pregnant individuals and found that their outcomes, in particular the outcome of continuing buprenorphine until the time of delivery, are pretty similar according to observational data. So we do all three. When we start people on buprenorphine, we how I counsel all of my patients is my recommendation to continue that medication through at least the baby's first birthday or 12 months postpartum. And that is for many reasons. The most um, notable reason is that um, mental health conditions, in particular overdose, have now become the leading cause of pregnancy-associated deaths in this country the leading cause above and beyond all the quote traditional medical causes that I was trained as, as an obstetrician, postpartum hemorrhage, hypertension, all those things. And most of those overdose related deaths that are occurring in the pregnancy and postpartum periods are happening in the six to 12 month postpartum period. Long after they've come in for their birth control or whatever other postpartum that needs that they may need from a general OBGYN or women's health clinic. So I counsel all my patients on my recommendation to continue their buprenorphine until their baby's first birthday. Buprenorphine dosing changes are very, very, very common in pregnancy and postpartum, just like with any other medication. <laughs> um, pregnancy leads to a lot of specialness when you're dosing medications. You're talking about things, levothyroxine, insulin, buprenorphine, they're all kind of the same. So how we manage that is that we very carefully and um, repeatedly monitor our patient's symptoms, craving, withdrawal, et cetera. And we see patients very, very repeatedly during the pregnancy and postpartum period to monitor them for those symptoms. In general, but everyone is different, and we published a paper on this, essentially the take-home point is you have to individualize it to the individual patient. However, if you're looking for a rule of thumb, generally, patients as they progress through the pregnancy period, they will generally need increases in their dosing, and they would also need split dosing too. And that's the same as we do for methadone also. So if a patient was taking 16 milligrams once a day before they were pregnant, it's very likely that that, that patient may gain, may gain some benefit from splitting that into eight twice a day and maybe increasing up to 24 or so. Postpartum, it's a really big catch-all. When we looked at data from our health system, we found about a third of patients increase their dose, a third of patients stay at their dose, and a third of patients decrease their dose. Again, every patient is different how that postpartum period manages out, and we really have a severe lack of data to guide buprenorphine changes through the pregnancy and postpartum period. And that's an area I feel very passionate about because, again, that postpartum period is when women are dying and their children are being separated from their mothers. And so there's ways that we can improve the treatment quality. And so buprenorphine, optimizing buprenorphine dosing based on clinical and other factors and seeing how well we can preemptively help patients tweak their dosing rather than waiting till maybe they're unstable would be a really big benefit to the research world. Yeah, really. Uh, uh... I, I'm struck in the the dosing changes and and all the dynamics there. But then, I, I will say when you started out, it just is is still not common enough that we understand medication use in in pregnant individuals. So at least we we have some of that information here. Um, Dr. Niaku, I want to turn to you. Um, Dr. Martin mentioned that kind of uh, window in, of an opportunity. Um, uh, I sometimes I think we see that in in infectious disease and where that might be a, a window of opportunity would love for you to talk about um, infectious disease as a potential entry point for initiating buprenorphine and then also tell us more about the work you do with incarcerated populations. Uh, thank you. And uh, like others have said, I really appreciate being able to be on this panel. Um, I probably will start with the context first so that you can understand where I'm coming from. Um, so I'm an infectious disease physician um, that focuses on, uh, on addiction treatment, um, particularly for individuals with HIV or at risk for HIV um, that have a substance use disorder. And so that's my clinical hat. And then I also wear a hat as a physician scientist 
scientist really looking at clinical trials. Um, and these clinical trials are testing the um, efficacy or effectiveness of novel therapeutics, either for HIV treatment or prevention, as well as for opioid use disorder, um, uh, so that we can really think about how do we best deploy these uh, advances we're having in our therapeutics so that we can be able to address and provide kind of differentiated care to be better match um, to the needs of our patients. And then my third hat is as the co-director of the Northern New Jersey Medication Assisted Treatment Center of Excellence. Um, so our governor, uh, in response to the uh, rising overdose deaths that were occurring in New Jersey, made these two centers of excellence. And so we have the uh, Northern that's situated here in Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School, um, in which we're focused on providing technical assistance, education, um, and support um, at the elbow support to um, providers uh, across New Jersey. Uh, so that are particularly focused on providing care to individuals that are insured um, through Medicaid. And so with, um, with these kind of three hats is where I'll talk about, uh, answer these two questions. And so for the first part about thinking about um, infectious disease as an entry point for initiating buprenorphine, what I'll actually say is kind of, is to have you all uh, understand the framework that we're currently using around HIV and ending the HIV epidemic as a part of a national strategy. And in this um, in this framework, we think about a continuum, and that there and we characterize this as a status neutral continuum. So when we think about providing comprehensive services for somebody that's living with HIV, in many ways, we can look at that mirror of those type of comprehensive services for somebody that may be at risk for HIV. And so all of the things that we're doing to prevent somebody's HIV is also a good practice for helping to treat someone's HIV. And so this is where we can see that initiating buprenorphine as it's related to today's conversation and as for opioid use disorder, but really addressing any substance use disorder can work both ways. Um, it is very effective and so um, I know we're talking about some of the data um, for that um, uh, is the foundation for the work that we do. So for instance, we, can, we know that with buprenorphine, that it is uh, a credit, incredibly effective. So buprenorphine and methadone will use in this um, scenario uh, that the data supports how effective it is to um, uh, promote someone staying on their HIV treatments and achieving virologic suppression. And so out of kind of all of the different evidence-based interventions that we have um, in, in my world for HIV treatment, the how powerful uh, buprenorphine is as one tool to improve somebody's virologic suppression is it's actually quite, a, uh, quite amazing. Similarly, when we think about this on the other side of our continuum, so we think about it on the HIV prevention side, side, and then I'm going to throw in hepatitis C prevention as well, that we see that um, somebody who has an opioid use disorder that's on um, a medication like buprenorphine will have um, a, at least a 50% uh, reduction in the risk of contracting HIV or hepatitis C. And so the um, so this is the way in which uh, buprenorphine um, and other in similar uh, agonist, partial agonist uh, type medications become very powerful tools as we think about um, the rising number of HIV infections that we have, rising number of hepatitis C infections. Um, and then we can talk about what do we understand understand about someone who ends up with serious bacterial infections and is hospitalized. And so we're talking about heart valve infections, so endocarditis, uh, osteovertebral vertebral osteomyelitis, um, septic arthritis. We've seen precipitous increases in um, these diagnoses, and they have the potential um, for significant morbidity and mortality. And so when someone is hospitalized and being treated um, for these infections, this represents an opportunity to have comprehensive addiction medicine services. And a part of those comprehensive addiction medicine services is the initiation of um, buprenorphine or potentially other uh, medications for their opioid use disorder. And it's really important, both in terms of helping them to complete the antibacterial treatment that is required for that serious infection, but then also um, reducing the risk of readmission, overdose-related um, presentations, and those things. Um, and so 
I will make the thread of why I'm also working uh, with individuals that have criminal legal involvement. And that is because there is a um, kind of a very strong connection between, um, or, or I should say that there is a high prevalence of uh, in incidence of HIV infections and hepatitis C infections in individuals that have uh, criminal legal involvement. And so this became a very natural extension of my HIV treatment and prevention work to really think about what are the needs for someone that has criminal legal involvement. And so, um, and so with that, it really comes back down to these principles that we talk about uh, around harm reduction. And with these harm reduction principles, again, it's where do medications sit? Where does buprenorphine sit in this conversation? And so that really is what brings us to, again, because of not only the infectious disease um, risk that we see in someone that has criminal legal involvement, but also the incredible overdose risk. And so um, there are studies showing that within the first two weeks of somebody being released um, from incarceration, uh, that in, during that time of re-entry into the community, their overdose risk, some studies have it as high as 40, 40 times as high as the general population, as high as 129 times that of the um, general population in the first two weeks. And so this represents, so someone that has criminal legal involvement is incredibly, and has an opioid use disorder, is incredibly vulnerable um, to overdose, overdosing and dying in this period of time. And so really having buprenorphine and other medications available while that person is incarcerated um, is uh, incredibly important in that time um, in which they're in um, a, a correctional facility represents, again, and another critical intervention point uh, for that um, for that individual. And so with that, I can pause there. Yeah, um, fascinating and and particularly the 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 connection right in the viral load and the the use of buprenorphine um, um, as well as recognizing the, the the risk when we're thinking about in, incarcerated populations. So everybody get ready. I'm going to come back to you and say, you know, adolescent, pregnant, postpartum, and and uh, infectious disease, incarcerated. What other dosage forms do you need? But we're first going to hear from Chad. So, Chad, that uh, was seeing... amazing information, and okay. thank you so much for having me. I'm coming from a completely different perspective. Yes. So, um, I am a policy advisor and content expert on harm reduction for ONDCP and SAMHSA. Um, person in long-term recovery from polysubstance use disorder, and um, also a former attorney. So um, my lived experience is much different. So my um, take on this is because um, I do a lot of implementation of outreach programs um, for um, disenfranchised communities. I'm not going to call them special populations because um, they're disenfranchised. So uh, we specifically work with people from LGBTQI plus communities and people from BIPOC communities. So that population is extremely difficult to reach for numerous reasons. Um, many have treatment trauma. Um, there's individuals that are not going to access a brick and mortar building um, because of fear of safety. Individuals don't access Good Samaritan immunity overdose laws out of fears of physical harm being caused to them by police. So we have to make sure that when we're delivering services, especially bup induction, to populations that we have proper diversity um, amongst peers. So this removes, I mean, obviously we need a um, physician, but that would be the only clinical um, person um, in that situation because we want to have a feeling of comfort and vulnerability, and we have to make sure that we have proper diversity. You know, um, one of the benefits of diversion of buprenorphine is we know that 80% of people that I've diverted buprenorphine use it to treat their own OUD. Um, so, you know, and I'll speak a little off here from, I'm not sure what other people said, but um, if it's easier to get fentanyl on the illicit market in your neighborhood, than Suboxone, you're doing something wrong. Both should be readily available and there should be active outreach programs that are targeting communities that we know have been systemically disenfranchised by our war on drugs and are not going to access treatment in a traditional fashion. So our methods today in response to what we've done for the past 140 years have to be untraditional. 
we have to create pet routes of access for individuals that we know are not going to accept those traditional routes. And that comes with a lot of creativity, ingenuity, um, and partnering with other community organizations, um, partnering with um, people who sell drugs uh, at the same time and getting community buy-in and involvement. So that whole area um, is very complex, uh, much longer than 10 minutes. But when, when we talk about that, when I talk about special populations, I'm in a whole other world of people that are um, dying and their deaths are being ignored completely. Also, they're dying from cross-contamination um, on a few medications. And um, a lot of the times it's assumed because of a postmortem toxicology that cannot identify time of consumption that a person intentionally purchased and ingested fentanyl when that is not what happened. We have issues with the lean supply right now, uh, which is contaminated and issues with the ecstasy supply. Now, it's very difficult to um, engage populations that um, when you're understand their cultural competency that some don't identify what they're using as a drug. And not only that, to tell them they're a drug user would be offensive and culturally inappropriate. They also don't identify that they're a risk for an overdose. So we have a very unique population we are trying to reach with some of these drugs that have been contaminated um, by fetty. Sorry, fentanyl. I use my street words. Um, so um, that's the services that I work on um, from a street outreach program and from a public policy standpoint. Yeah. So, so Chad, in that space, if you think about the currently available dosage formulation for buprenorphine, whether it's you know the the singular product or buprenorphine with naloxone, what? Um, what would you we've heard earlier in the day that you know higher dose lower dose the ability to get um more access to the transdermal patches are there are there are there dosing needs there I, you're obviously no, I mean, dealing there's, with there's much an educational uh -huh. there's yep, so there's, there's so many needs um there's an educational piece there because we know that some of the fetty analogs do have a second metabolite period. So people are going to precipitate withdrawals um, without being properly educated on Bernice method of microdosing. Um, we have the ability to use full agonists um, to um, alleviate withdrawal symptoms until the street fentanyl is out of their system. We are not allowed to use those full agonists. Um, we have issues with um, traditional recovery um, communities bashing medication. And if you listen very closely, they're never attacking the medication. They think they are, but what they're presenting is a logical fallacy where they're attacking their doctor who didn't understand how to do a proper taper. So the education piece is huge. The inconsistency of the street product right now is the biggest barrier because um, we'll do testing of live samples that I'll purchase off the black market. And on an average, we have four different fentanyl analogs um, diphenhydramine, find a bunch of different cuts, there's no consistency. So one person could actually have a successful induction, you know, at two or four milligrams, another person is going to be on the floor. Um, right. Very, very sick. So that's why we get to discussions that are this country or not, is not ready for We're talking about access to a safe supply um, and things of that nature. Uh, but we do have access to full agonists um, that could stave off withdrawals until the fentanyl is out of their system. And the fact that we're not using prescription um, heroin, prescription fentanyl or Dilaudid at this point um, is is a mystery to me. Mm -hmm. uh, we're actually going to hear a little bit about that tomorrow as well um, from an outside the U.S. Um, use there. But I want to I want to turn to to um, doctors Bonnie Martin and and Niaku uh, thoughts on. Um, different formulations that you might need. Actually, uh, Dr. Bonnie, we heard earlier about um, adolescent needs, it, you know, that having to, to do anything during school, right? Not, not ideal, um, sure. but, but other, what, what do you see for needs in the adolescent space? What, what sure. might be helpful? I'm gonna break it up into three different categories of I think issues that could be addressed. So one is just broader age indications for um, treatment options. We had a family come in with their 14 year old and they wanted supplicate and we had to get ethics board, pharmacy board approval. 
um, then sublocate, you have to order it through a central pharmacy, get prior authorization. It's a really delayed process. So I think making the process easier and really getting broader age indications would really help. Um, because when they're not approved for younger kids, it sounds like, well, then they're not safe for this population. The second is that we now have a population of, say, about 50 to 60 individuals who've been with us 10 to 12 years who are on maintenance um, buprenorphine. Um, they're really into three, I would say that we have three populations. We have the population who was maintained for three, four or five years and then slowly weaned and some who've come off. Those people you find, they start ripping their film into corners and pieces and whatnot while they're while they're trying to wean off. So again, that's where those lower doses or wean packets would be really helpful, but slow packets. Then I have a group who's weaned down to a lower dose, maybe eight milligrams. And when you start the wean, you really only want to drop by like one or two milligrams because you don't want them to be uncomfortable. And the current doses don't allow for that. So mm. sometimes we're having them cut them. Um, in order to just do a small drop. So that would be, there would be more room for formulations. And then that brings me to my last population, which is I have a group now who's been on 16 to 24 for years and may never wean down, but are doing great. They're parenting, they're working. And I would love to see a single rod, like the next non contraceptive, very easy to put in, can last for several years, doesn't require anything daily, so that these people don't need to have a daily reminder for the rest of their lives. And these are people, I mean, 28, 32, like what is the long-term lookout for them, right? So it'd be really nice to have something that can last years for them and they can go on and you know live their lives. And then the last comment I wanna make is about containers because we were talking about safety and the safety is both keeping children out, but as I mentioned, the biggest safety we have is family stealing it. That's the biggest issue. Um, it'd be great if we could make containers that are like fingerprint locks so that the only person who can open it is the actual person for whom it was prescribed. I'm sure that technology exists. It's probably expensive, but if there's a way to do that, that would solve a lot of safety issues, I think, both on both ends of the safety um, spectrum. Yeah, yeah, uh, really in intriguing ideas. Um, I'll go to Dr. Niaku and then Dr. Martin. Any dosage you want to see? And Chad, I am going to come back to you. I know you want education, but I'm going to come back and see if there's a dose. I've got the dose part too. So. All right. Uh, and so I think you know, that I'll piggyback off of what Dr. Bonnie said, that um, before we even kind of start to talk about formulations, we really have to think about accessibility. Um, and so... Um, I think that it is very critical to put out there and continue to uh, uh, push for uh, more widespread um, action is the fact that people are unable to feel, fill their current prescriptions for buprenorphine from yep. a pharmacy in their communities. And people have to go to such extreme um, uh, lengths to be able to get these medications. And so we, this needs to be addressed um, uh, by the continued perce perception um, of uh, the DEA coming, auditing, shutting down pharmacies because they're dispensing too much buprenorphine. This really needs to be addressed and tackled head on um, so that we can um, alleviate one of the bottlenecks um, that we're currently um, seeing um, in accessibility. Uh, then I think that the it, the um, the other part of accessibility is around cost, um, because we do have other formulations that we've talked about. And then um, here, so if we're talking about extended release buprenorphine that um, you have to do for your prior authorization, some plans it's not covered under your pharmacy benefits, instead it's under a medical benefit and being able to go through the logistics that then on the clinical side, it's got to be a buy and bill. And that's not what these um, clinics are set up to do, um, instead of it being directly um, uh, charged and processed through someone's insurance. So these, um, these types of um, barriers reduce the accessibility. And so again, you know, we don't even need to talk about formulations. You know, Dr. Bonnie mentioned about having an implant. We did have an implant um, for buprenorphine, but there was such low uptake of that because cost and then accessibility um, because of the cost when people are then trying to get that paid for that ultimately um, 
um, it, it um, has no use. Um, so, uh, and then some specific things around formulations, I think, are again about understanding what are the needs um, for how people take medications. Um, we, we see this very much in uh, the HIV world about single tablet formulations to make things uh, much more convenient for uh, what uh, people need. And so again, instead of having to cut the films and do these things, or if they're going to either do an induction where it's going to be slow and they're going to need to have it gradually increase, having those pills packet or pill or film packaging to make it easy for people to be able to follow along because that often um, is impeding that out this being uh, feasible in the outpatient setting. And similarly, if someone is needing to do a higher dose um, kind of administration, again, formulations or packaging that then helps um, so that someone is able to do this is very, uh, very much necessary. I would say that um, some of the things uh, around Around extended release um, buprenorphine is um, uh, relate to tolerability of receiving the injection. There's incredible burning um, sensation with the with the depot placement, so subcutaneous abdominal um, injection, and so that often um, can cause people to discontinue treatment. They also end up with subcutaneous nodules that persist for months and months, um, and um, and that too is something uh, that. Uh, uh, is um, uh, deterring people for wanting to uptake this, even though it's really nice to not have to think about, you know, um, their medications a month at a time because they come to their clinical visit, check in, and then receive their medications. And so definitely uh, much more um, development in this regard uh, is needed so that we can be able to use um, these uh, or make sure that there's a, a full array of um, formulations available for individuals to be able to, uh, to match their preferences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to flag for you, Dr. Niaku, the end of our prior panel, they also suggested a, a co-packaging of buprenorphine with PrEP and contraceptive. So um, Dr. Martin, uh, you want to add anything that we're missing on the formulation and and absolutely hear you on the accessibility and and it speaks to kind of the 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 uh, great need for those who will go to the healthcare system that the healthcare system serve and and have product available but dr martin yeah i have three more things to add on i agree with everything that's been said um for extended release options those are excellent and we've looked at patients in the postpartum period who elect to transition to post uh, to, ex to extended release options and there's a lot of additional benefits for our patients especially the ones who started buprenorphine in pregnancy now we're nine months later you know and they're parenting right and they have a lot of things going on and trying to take your medication still every day can be quite hard when you have a newborn infant at home and so extended release options are exceptionally important um, especially for the postpartum people However, as I mentioned earlier, the physiologic changes that are inherent to pregnancy in the postpartum period make it an extended release options for any medication quite challenging sometimes. And what makes it the most challenging is that pregnant and pregnant and people who are breastfeeding are almost always excluded from clinical trials. And that is a huge problem. I don't need to emphasize that more. Everyone knows what happened in the COVID-19 pandemic with the vaccines and the same similar situation occurred. And so my, my push is more research on extended release options that incorporate pregnant and postpartum individuals do get pharmacokinetic data, do get physio that correlate with clinical symptomatology. So we can get the data from clinical trials as they're working on these extended release options to inform the next phase of research to see how can we tailor these extended release dosing options for the pregnancy and for the postpartum period. Because right now these things come out and then we have no idea what to do with my patient population. And that um, has a lot of issues <laughs> that I can go on a whole soapbox about. The second thing is dosing. Like I mentioned earlier, because of the physiologic changes of pregnancy, just patients a lot of times will need increased doses of their buprenorphine in order to maintain the same level of symptomatology. You know, you have a higher blood volume, the medication gets diluted, your pH of your saliva even changes when you're pregnant, which changes the absorption. There's a whole host of things that are occurring. 
And what happens in my state is that I can prescribe above 24 milligrams without a whole bunch of paperwork. And I and there has been data to show that pregnant individuals especially may very may need higher than 24 milligrams. I know that varies by state by state, but that is a huge problem that we deal with. I very commonly need to go above 24 milligrams, especially as I'm splitting the dose for my pregnant and postpartum people. I say pregnant and postpartum pregnancy is obvious with the physiologic changes of pregnancy, but that postpartum period, people are dealing with comorbid perinatal mood disorders. They're dealing with increased depression, increased anxiety, all the things that are putting them at a higher risk of those overdose related deaths, which are the number one cause of pregnancy associated deaths through the postpartum period. And then the third thing I would call for, which might sound kind of silly, but it's a big deal in my world, is the taste of the film and the tabs. <laughs> if you've ever been pregnant, you might have experienced that you're just a little extra nauseous. And you might just be a little bit extra, have a little more sensitivity to certain tastes or smells. And so if you take the film, which doesn't really have a great taste to start with when you're not pregnant, it's a big bear. I'm not kidding. It's a big bear. I've had patients have to stop their buprenorphine because the taste is so just aggravating to them during the pregnancy period. And, they're, and that's putting them at overdose risk because they can't tolerate the taste. It's become that extreme. So it's a, we do all the things to try to get around it. But if someone can make a buprenorphine tab or film that tasted good, that would be a big deal in my life. <laughs> uh, I know we're going to hear that again, <laughs> um, I, as well as some that would dissolve faster. But but Chad, I I I hear you on the the different approach to uh, like like rethinking the overall uh, uh, approach generally and the education need any thoughts on dosage or Definitely. i want to give you and, the stage to say more yeah we only have a few minutes um it's been 12 years i can still taste what it tastes like and that's that bad um so lots of issues first off we're so we're babysitting individuals by adding naloxone um for no reason except we don't want you to possibly abuse a partial agonist, which is much safer than the fentanyl that will kill you. So um, we would get more people induced if it was just Subutex, which would help with the cost issue, induction issue, so many issues. We, but we have to nanny people in this country, which is absurd at this point. Um, next issue, anecdotal. I have not met a single person that has been on um, Subutex for six months stopped and had any withdrawal symptoms. The problem is the jump from one milligram off is very difficult for people as the doctors know. And if we take them back up to eight and put them on subuclade, it will be easier for some people. Doctors won't do that. Um, and that has to be something that has to be discussed. And then for, um, my, so my class is on for Dr. Ronnie, um, you can make a tincture with vinegar um, when you have to get below one milligrams. Uh, you have to use vinegar in order to make a tincture. You have to use alcohol or vinegar. Obviously, not can use alcohol, but if you dissolve the strip into vinegar, you can make a homemade tincture, and then you can dose out those little um, microdoses. And apple cider vinegar might help with the taste problem. Uh, I don't know how that would taste, but it might be better. Um, but lots of issues there. But especially the biggest issue is the 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 unnecessary cost addition um, to prevent the possible misuse by adding the lockjaw to the formulation. It's at this point, it's just I'm scratching my head. Um, and then with the um, implant, as I believe you can only get two because of the location from that first one that went out. So I think that would be a great option if they had a different way to um, administer it. But the subuclade um, reports I've heard back from hundreds of people that have been on it have been very positive as far as mild withdrawals, there's almost none. So take your patients from one back to eight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chad, I think that is just spot on. If my colleagues agree, we're gonna let you have the final word um, because that was uh, you know, powerful reminder of how we should think about things and, and, and thinking through and moving forward. So thank you you to the four of you for the work that you do during the day and for joining us today to share your thoughts about um, how we might do better in buprenorphine um, initiation and management. 
in uh, marginalized populations, right, Chad? That's my phrase. Uh, Either one word. I say disenfranchised, marginalized we works. All right. But we know who we're talking about. We'll be all right. Our war on drugs. Absolutely. All right. So thank you all very much. I will say to everyone who is listening to our session today, um, thank you so much. We're going to end today and we will be back tomorrow. Um, we will be posting our recording for this event by next week, but we hope to see you back tomorrow to continue the conversation. Thanks so much and have a great afternoon. Thank you.